Hey, welcome to the live stream for June 20th, 2018. I am your host, Dana Morningstar. Hey, welcome to the live stream. Oh, let me mute it here. There we go. So how is everybody doing tonight? Sam is here. Hello, Wonder Panda, Tanitria, Beavis, Kevin. Andrew, Camilla, <laughs> Camilla says, I'm on time. New Chris, hello, hello. Dora, yes, it has been a long time since I've seen you. It's nice to have you back. Heather, welcome. How's everybody's week going? Oh, how cool, Dandelion. Dandelion Green says, I gave my 24-year-old very sweet daughter with autism your one-year inspirational journal, and she seemed excited to have it. Very cool. I hope she enjoys going through it. It's, um, I think it's one of those books that, it's just, it's fun. It's fun to kind of be introspective and to gain insights into ourself. So I hope she enjoys it. And by the way, I did get your letter. So I've been writing thank you cards. So I got a batch done today and I will work on a batch probably a little bit tomorrow and then for sure Friday and get those out in the mail. So thank you. Uh, Camilla says, Dana, I've been trying to find your PO box and I can't seem to find it. It should be in the about section of my YouTube channel, but it's uh, Dana Morningstar. P.O. Box 464, Mason, Michigan, 48854. If you want to send a card or anything, it's just fun. It's just fun. I've gotten a wide variety of things from people. I've gotten some really cool art from people and some amazing letters and a wonderful book and just lots of things. It's amazing. I would never... I have expected people to want to send me mail, but it's uh, always very much appreciated. Surf Smurf says, I can't believe I'm finally making a live stream after so many weeks. Well, good to have you. They're kind of fun, I have to say. It's fun to be able to chat with people in the chat and just the whole, the whole experience is so different when you're live. And even, even for me too, like when I go into other people's live streams, it's so different from actually watching the, the later recorded video. So I hope you enjoy it. And let's see, what is going on? I, uh, oh, I am going to be recording starting tomorrow, the first audiobook for Start Here. So that's going to be a new experience. Paul, I don't know if he's on tonight, but he <laughs> has been so wonderful. He does a lot of audio. He's helped me before with um, uh, the, I did a guided meditation thing about a year or two ago. He did all of the sound for that and helped remix that. And so he was helping, working with me with uh, trying to record an audio book. And oh my goodness, there is so much to it. And so I was all set to do it. We, we had spent, I mean, probably, I don't even know how many hours we were working on stuff. And then after the house fire, everything, like, you know, my studio was gone. So I've had, I'm slowly rebuilding my new studio but I'm in an apartment now and there's just a lot of noise and it's not going to work. So I finally just made the decision. I'm going to go ahead and just go into a recording studio where, you know, they've got all the equipment and everything, and then I can just record the book there. So I'm excited about it. It's going to be a totally new experience and we shall see how it goes. Kind of nervous about it, <laughs> but we'll see. Oh, thank you, Beavis. You said, uh, sent a live stream donation and says, thanks for all the videos you do for us. You are so very welcome. It's my pleasure. And I'm just thrilled that people find something of value in something that I say. Like, that's just the coolest thing ever. 
Oh, wonderful. Sally says, thank you, Dana. My sister-in-law introduced you to me and helped me to understand what I had been trying to figure out. Now I see that I wasn't crazy. I was only being abused. So thank you. I'm so glad that you were able to get the clarity and the validation you were looking for. I, I think all of us have been in your shoes where we're like, something's wrong, but I'm not sure quite what, and I'm not sure if it's them or if it's me or kind of what's going on and is this normal or is like what just what is happening so that's a really difficult place to to be so clarity is clarity is everything kevin says audiobooks are my go to these days reading is hard with a fuzzy brain yeah it's audio in general i think is kind of where the world is going podcasts are are huge. I know for me, at least, you know, if I'm going on like a long road trip somewhere or even for, actually that's not even true. Like even if I'm going five minutes down the street, I listen to podcasts all the time. And before it was podcasts, I would just eat up my data (laughs) And and would listen to YouTube videos as I was driving. So audiobooks, I think is a great way to, to go. I don't know. It'll be fun. But after I finish recording and they clean up all of the, you know, the recording and everything to think about different things that I can do. I'm kind of thinking what I might do is to um, put out different chapters of the book as YouTube videos. So we'll see. We'll see how that goes. And then something else that I've been working on uh, is that my next book out I've been kind of playing around with the title. I need to post the cover of it. I'm almost done. The cover is, is almost ready, but it's so weird. Like when you make something like that, cause like what I think looks good <laughs> or like what I think makes for a good title may not actually be a good cover or a good title. And so it's always good to have feedback on these kinds of things. So uh, the next book out, is going to be solely on manipulation, manipulation tactics, like what it is, how they go down, different types of manipulation, different types of manipulators, how just the cycles. I mean, it's just really, really thorough, like the different cycles of manipulation, the different cycles of emotionally what goes on with the person and then the different cycle of breaking free from manipulation. And so my kind of running title of that book, I guess you could say, is called The Narcissist's Playbook. And the cover, I'll have to put, I'll have to figure out a way to post it. I guess I could put it, put it on my website. I'm thinking what I might do is two different covers for the book and two different titles and have people vote on them and just see like what, I don't know, what people think. I feel like I kind of, my first book, the, the start here book is um, probably not the best title <laughs> since it's really vague. So I don't want to make that mistake again. I want to make sure that people who might be looking for a book on the topic, find the book that they're looking for. Right. Dandelion says, yes, we all feel like they use a playbook. Yeah. I agree. It's, it all kind of go, tends to go down the same, same way, doesn't it? Okay. Well, thank you, Kimberly. She says, I just got on. I missed your news about your audiobooks, but I am totally confident your choices will be well thought out and good. Well, like I said, I appreciate the the confidence, but uh, I hope it's amazing <laughs> all of the different ways that I can, my thinking as far as putting a book together can just kind of take a left turn. So we, we shall see. I'll post a link next time. Oh, speaking of next time. So next week we will have the live stream and then Thursday we'll have the book club. And the book club book for this month, everything kind of got pushed back a month because of the fire. But uh, this, so not next Thursday, 
I'm sorry, not this Thursday, next Thursday, we're going to be discussing my second book, which is Out of the Fog. So, and I will be putting together, I normally try to do like my top seven takeaways, depending on how many I have, top seven to top 11 takeaways of every book that we read for book club. And it's a little bit of a challenge since I wrote the book. So, uh, but I'm going to try to pull out what I feel are like the top seven things that I really hope that people take away from the book, like the seven main points that I really hope to have hammered home. So we'll be discussing those points in the book. If you have any questions about the book or about, you know, anything, questions, comments, concerns, frustrations, what have you, then would be the time. And I am totally warmly, warmly welcome any constructive criticism or discussion about that book. Okay, let me scroll up here. Uh, Gigi says, I would love a Cliff Notes book on your reviewed books. You know, I have thought about doing that and I don't know how to go about that in uh, like a legal an ethical way. So I don't know if I need to reach out to the publishers and seeks. I would love, I read so much and I read a ton of self-help books and I just really enjoy kind of going through and, and digging out different nuggets and different books. Now, granted, I will say one of the things that I've noticed, and you probably noticed this too, when you, when you guys read self-help books, but the book, like the takeaways we have from the book tend to change as we grow and change. So like my, my takeaways from three years ago might be very different from my takeaways, you know, now. So that's always kind of fun to see how you grow and change. But I, I don't know. I think it would be fun to write little mini books about takeaways or to combine it all into one book. Uh, Yes, Heather says, I'm sorry, this is only my second live stream. Is this your normal live stream time? If so, I'd like to catch more. So I'll put you on my calendar if this is a regular time slot. Awesome. Yes, this is our normal time, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we run for about three hours. So, and I do also make these live streams into uh, podcasts. So if you don't catch me on the video and you want to listen later, by all means, you can watch the video, but you can also catch it on the podcast, which is pretty much everything that I do online is under the name Thrive After Abuse. So you can find me on Instagram and on Facebook and on iTunes and Dana Morningstar or Thrive After Abuse is how, is how you can find me. Uh, let's see here. Oh my goodness. Uh, Amy says, Dana, I need help with a narcissistic coworker. She is very manipulative and is now spreading lies about me and I am being investigated for bullying her. Oh boy. Well, I would say keep a paper trail of everything. Try to not ever be alone with her. Even if it seems like, oh, this isn't gonna be a big deal or this is a short conversation. If she's looking to try to get you fired or to wreak havoc in your life, just don't even give her any opportunity. So, um, you know, when you do, if you do meet with HR or what have you, I would just be very clear of like, you know, I'm not bullying her. I would be curious to see what she has to say. If anything, it's the exact opposite. She's bullying me. I would prefer to have no contact or as limited contact with her as humanly possible and let just let them know what's what's going on but keep a paper trail so everything all communication with her is done through email through voicemail through um you know handwritten something or other because she will twist everything she'll twist everything so the, the, the less you can give her that opportunity, the better. Uh, 
Uh, James asks, how's everyone doing this evening? And Dana, how are you? I, you know, I'm doing pretty good. I, we're slowly chugging along. I, I think I said, mentioned that last week I broke down and went shopping, <laughs> which I, I don't like shopping at all, but I, I bought, I don't know, it was like five or six shirts and kind of the basics. It got me started, but that was a good feeling to just get some, you know, get some clothes. That's always a plus. And yeah, I'm going to be recording my first audio book tomorrow. I'm going to go in for five hours tomorrow. So that'll be its own learning curve. And I've, so I've been watching all these videos on YouTube about, you know, uh, basically how to keep your voice going and how to pr try to prepare yourself for something like this and kind of what to expect. So um, it's, it's going to be interesting. Uh, did I read this right? New Chris, are you going to Rome? Hold on, I've got to scroll up here. Cha-cha-cha. Uh, James says, Dana, did you buy some fancy coat hangers? Uh, Yes, I did. I, that's my, <laughs> that's my, my little luxury or these kind of velvet coat hangers. They're so wonderful for tops that have like a wide collar because they just slip off regular plastic hangers. So yes, I bought a stack of those black velvet hangers. I love them so much. So, so much. And let's see, new Chris, I don't think he's responded yet, but yes. Oh, you're, oh, wow. You're going to Rome first thing tomorrow. Uh, you know, <laughs> he says, which is like in four hours for me. Oh my gosh. Here, here's some things about Rome. I, I have been to Rome. I did a study abroad when I was in college. I went in uh, Florence and so we went to Rome fairly often. The biggest thing with Italy is the number of pickpockets. And that's actually, I have a whole section in my book on manipulation about, about that. Cause there's different types of manipulation. And I call that one like the hit and run cause they move so smooth. So my biggest tip for you is, you know, obviously don't keep your wallet in your back pocket. Uh, try to keep like a credit card on you. Um, just be very uh, kind of um, aware of your surroundings. I wouldn't let any stranger get within about three feet of you. Uh, beware of people that seem if, like if they're following you because they probably are. So, you know, theft over there is, is, is a big thing. Um, outside of that, places to go, I'm sure you're going to do all the, the basics, right? Like the Vatican and the Colosseum and uh, places like that. There is the Borghese Palace, which is not one of the more common tourist things to go see. I That was one of my favorite places in Rome. So it's just like fantastic. The marble sculptures, there's a few, and I forget the sculptor's name who did them. They're absolutely fantastic. And I'm not even sure that Today, they even understand how he did what he did. His work is just phenomenal. And yes, of course, you have to get some gelato and pizza. Yeah. So... Uh, let's see, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Of course, St. Peter's Cathedral is amazing, worth going to. Uh, it's just a fantastic city. I, I hope that you'll be able to see, to take in as much as you possibly can when you're there. And then tell us all about it when you get back. That's another thing. If I swear, if time and money were no object, I would love to go around and explore new places and write about them. Because there's just so many hidden things in, in cities. 
So that's, that would be fun. Um, let's see here. Let me scroll up. Gigi says, Dana, where's your tea? I, I know I need to order some. I ordered a bunch off of Amazon because the kind that I love my Egyptian licorice tea, they, I can't find it in the store anymore. So, and I keep meaning to order it and I keep forgetting it, but I still, I have water with me today in my mug, but I, I need to get some because I think that really does help my voice and it tastes delicious. Uh, let's see here. Oh, thank you, Elizabeth. She says, hello everyone. And how are you, Dana? I'm sending love. It's fantastic. James says, he's trying to navigate the dating scene when it's hard because he's used to being love bombed by toxic people. I agree. And one of the hardest things about that is to not be attracted to the love bombing. If that's a, if that's been an ongoing hook for you, like that level of intensity and moving at whirlwind speed, it can take a little while to slow down and, and just do things differently. And and just to take things slow. So I just realized that the light <laughs> is really bright. I look, hold on a second. I look like, do you remember that Simpsons episode with um, Mr. Burns? <laughs> and he's like glowing in the dark. Like that's how I feel like I look. Hold on just a second. Let me see if I can turn this down. Okay, let's see if that's better. Okay. Wow, that was such a funny episode. I need to watch that again. Natasha says, get some lemon cello. Yes, lemon cello is delicious. I second that. Uh, Dandelion Green says, yes, feeling loved without it being, without being love bombed is my new challenge. Yes, it's huge. Gigi says, I love that you referenced an old Simpsons episode. Oh, I used to love that show. I still love that show. It's just such a, such a great one. He, he was, and I forget what it was. Like he was all, I don't know if he was doped up on painkillers or what his deal was, but they kept seeing this glowing person out in the woods and he was like walking like this and he would tell him, he's like, I bring you love. And then they were like, he brings us love, get him. And then like everybody would attack him. Ah, oh, funny. Yes, Kevin says that was the X-Files crossover episode. That's right, that's right. Uh, Jacqueline says, I'm on for the first time. Thank you, Dana, for all you do. You have made such a difference in my life. That's awesome. I'm so... Glad you could make it. And I'm glad to hear that I've been able to make a difference. That's just the coolest thing. Missouri Cowboy says, I planted more sweet potatoes today to celebrate. And I did lots of happy dancing. Very cool. You and your sweet potatoes. I did, never met anybody that's planted so many different varieties of sweet potatoes. I didn't even know there were so many varieties of sweet potatoes until you mentioned it on one live stream. Mm, Diane says, I just went back to work for my old boss. She's an overt narcissist. I signed up for part-time weekends and she's already smashing my boundaries, trying to push me for more. I haven't slept well since. Ugh, yeah. That's, so difficult and it's so difficult when you're dealing with somebody like that who especially is in a position of authority over you you know because being assertive trying to set boundaries trying to hold boundaries tends to just really be an uphill battle and it tends to just be a ton of stress so i would just encourage you to really kind of think about 
you know, is there, is there another place that you could work part-time or is there a way, could you transfer to like a different department or is there some sort of way that you don't have to work under, under somebody like that? Because just this, I mean, I know that sometimes we've got to do what we've got to do, but man, I tell you the stress of those kinds of situations, if you can at all get out of there or get things changed up to where it's workable, then I highly recommend it. Okay. Let me see. Hmm. That's so true. Al Kuda Babe says, being loved takes time, doesn't it? I remember after Alan, I was looking for love in all of the wrong places. That's so true. Being loved really does take time. And a person with sincere intentions who I think understands the value that they bring and who understands like how to operate with respect in general, like they're selective in, in who they're dating and they, they're they mature enough to keep, to go slow enough to kind of just get to know that person. Cause ever, I mean, seriously, when we have chemistry with another person, it always feels amazing and it always feels so right. And then more often than not, it, when you start to really get to know that person, it's like, Ooh, you know, like we don't jive in these certain ways. And that's, that's a big deal. And it, then people have hurt feelings and whether it's them or whether it's us, it's just, there's so much value to just going at it at a slow pace. Heather says, I would appreciate anyone's help or advice. I know I need to leave my narcissistic husband. I'm just so worried about my three kids. They're 12, 10, and eight. How did your young kids handle leaving in the divorce? They hate what they see now. That's a great question. There is a book, if you are open to reading it, called Divorce Poison. And that book was just so chock full of information. It was basically how to go about divorcing um, a, a manipulative person and more importantly, how to try to protect your children from it. So, you know, I think oftentimes having, the good thing is even though your children are young, they're still old enough to understand. So I think explaining things to them in an age appropriate way and really providing the kind of environment of, you know what, you guys, like we can talk about things and it's okay. And, you know, I'm your mom and making sure that, that they don't feel, cause I think all children of divorce tend to kind of feel like that they need to protect their parents for them to realize like, it's okay. I'm going to be okay. You know, I'm here for you. I'm concerned that you're going to be okay. Like, let's talk about things. Um, really keeping communication open, being able to discuss, for them to discuss their feelings with you, letting them know that your house is a safe place because they're going to feel torn, most likely. You know, they probably love their father because he's their father, but at the same time, they don't like a lot of things that he's doing. And so just allowing them a kind of a neutral place for, to explore those feelings, which can be incredibly difficult if you know, when you've been on the receiving end of abuse for years, it's normal for a person to want to chime in and kind of, you know, uh, attack him or to talk poorly about him. But so it's kind of a fine line with walk, walking that fine line of just validating them. And, you know, I'm really sorry that this happened to you or that you had to see that or that uh, you heard that or that, you know, dad did something like that to you that that wasn't right and that wasn't fair. And, you know, would you like to talk about it or um, these kinds of things? So there's a lot of different divorce groups out there specifically for parents that are either thinking about divorce or that have divorced and asking I think, a lot of other people about how to prepare children, how to talk to children, how to provide like, a safe, loving environment for them afterwards. Um, and I would say for you, to really focus on getting a plan in place as far as how, 
what are you going to do for emotional support? Because it is going to be a big change and he's probably going to be very difficult. That's pretty common anyhow with divorce, but let alone with a narcissist. So kind of getting a plan of like, who is on your team? Who are your support people? Where can you go? Uh, These kinds of things. There's also something, if you're thinking about a divorce, uh, to talk to an attorney now and see what all would be involved in getting like a financial separation. Because what is really common is when a narcissist or really, a, a, this is probably a good idea for anybody. People, divorce tends to take on a life of its own and how people think that their partner is going to react and how they end up reacting are often two very different things. So getting a financial separation, because what can happen is then the person gets all upset and they get, they just, they're, they're bitter, they're jaded, they're wounded. They're, you know, who else knows what's going on with them. They might rack up a lot of credit card debt. They might, you know, do all kinds of things in order to be really um, just to try to ruin the other person. So if you can talk to an attorney about potentially getting a financial separation before you let him know that you're planning on divorcing that way, things are separated and any debt that he occurs, um, accrues is going to be on him. It wouldn't necessarily be joint. So that might be a good place to start. If you do talk to attorneys, I would mention, you know, that your ex is whatever is going on, verbal abuse, emotional abuse, manipulation, and to see if they're familiar. I'm sure that they are, but to make sure that they're really familiar with handling, um, handling that kind of a situation. Okay. Oh, wonderful. She says, I've been very open with them without bashing him. I've been in therapy for about nine months and my kids are too. Wonderful. That's huge. That's huge. You know, I think too, my mom and I had a conversation about divorce and stuff a few months ago. And, and, you know, she was saying, she's like, you know, I, she's like, I wish things would have been different. I wish I would have done things different. And my response was, you know, she really tried. Like that was the truth. I mean, she exhausted every option she knew she had. I mean, she had us in therapy. She was in therapy. Uh, She really shielded us from everything that she possibly could. And there were a lot of things that she really did right. And so perhaps even talking to your children and letting them know, hey, you know what, you guys, like I'm navigating this for the first time. And I just, I really want us to be able to for you guys to be able to come to me and share if there's any questions, concerns, frustrations, like let's talk about that and really making a point to spend time. Cause you've got, you know, three kids that are all close to being teenagers and teenagers tend to kind of go do their own thing anyhow, you know, but if you can do certain things, making quality time a priority in your house can be huge. So, and I don't know how much of this you guys already do, making it a point to like, hey, let's go out for a walk or for a soda or sitting down and eating dinner together on a more regular basis, just that time for connection. Uh, One of the things I used to work with kids, juvenile um, offenders that were teenagers. And one of the things that we did that's funny because kids, they didn't like this at first, but then I think that they, well, then not, not even, I think they really warmed up to it. And I think many of them looked forward to it. We used to do this thing at dinner time called a high low and everybody would go around and they would say the high point of their day and then the low point of their day. And it was just a really great way for people to let each other know like what was going on with them and also to find out what was going on with other people. And it just really, I think, helped to kind of gel the group together. So those are some ideas. Okay, let me. Uh, 
And Beth says, yes, Dana, I talked to my son and we hug and cry together. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's good. That connection is so important. I think especially with, I think all kids have a rough go of it, but I think boys in general tend to shut down more because there's still that stigma with guys of like, you know, if you're, something's going on with you, you don't talk about it. You just, you toughen up, you know, boys don't cry, this kind of thing. And so a lot of, a lot of, especially, well, I think boys of any age tend to start lashing out and they become a lot more aggressive. So, you know, talking about feelings, it's, it can be a really strange thing for people in general, because as a society, we don't really tend to do that, but it's the earlier you can kind of role model that behavior and talk about emotions and realize, okay, this is not a bad thing. It's just, we all experience emotions and the more you can normalize that, I think the uh, better, the more emotional insight they end up having. Uh, ooh, Diane. Okay, uh, Diane says, hey, I've, been, I've been racking my brain about how to tell her that working for her isn't going to work for me. Should I tell her in person or write a nice text message? So are you thinking about quitting? And I think if you are thinking about quitting, are you needing to use her as a reference? So that would kind of determine the advice that I give. If you have to, here's what I would do in general, just in general, I'm a big fan of like, you know, owning our stuff. So even though it's her, instead of being like, well, you know what, you are incredibly demanding and difficult and just overall rotten. <laughs> like I can't work with you. Like that goes over like a lead balloon. Right. But if you can just say, you know what, I, there's so many kind of the whole sandwich approach. So you're starting off with positive, then you kind of have the constructive criticism or like the issue in the middle. And then you kind of end on with something positive. So saying something like, man, there are so many things I really like about this job. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, you know, I don't know. The, uh, the, the vision and the, the work here is engaging and it's enjoyable. Uh, however, I've come to realize that this is, I'm just not, that this job just really isn't a good fit for me. And I think it would be best if I start looking for employment elsewhere again, and then end with something positive. Again, thank you so much for the opportunity to come back and be able to work here. I really appreciate that. Uh, I'm kind of thinking about turning in my two weeks and effective as of, you know, July 15th or what have you. Sincerely, Diane. Right. And then just kind of leaving it at that. So I wouldn't necessarily, you don't need to address her behavior specifically. It's not going to get you anywhere and she's only going to go on more of the attack. So that's how I would handle it. And I would give it to her in writing either. And I don't know your work situation, but either like a handwritten note or ideally email that way you've got some sort of paper trail. So you know, then it doesn't turn into a he said, she said kind of a thing. Uh, okay. Oh, Colin, hello, says, hi, I'm glad you got settled into your new place. I'm sorry, I cannot stay. Well, thank you. And thank you for the live stream donation. I appreciate it. Yes, slowly getting settled in. So nice. I tell you, it's amazing how uh, little stuff I we just I feel like we just don't really need that much. Travis and I were talking about this the other day. I was like, this house is pretty empty, but I don't like what did we even have before? Like besides, I mean, obviously besides pictures and stuff like that and house plants, like there's not a whole lot more that I feel like we really need. It's just strange. 
Okay, Diane says, I don't need her for a reference. And yes, I am thinking about quitting. Yeah, I wouldn't burn that bridge just because you never know with these kinds of personalities. If she really gets ticked off, you don't want her coming to your house or causing a scene or just talking a lot of junk about you. I would just put it on you. You know what? I, I thought I would be able to come back and I really do enjoy. There's so much about this job that I really enjoy, but I'm just really thinking it's not a good fit. And I think it would be in both of our best interests if, you know, if I turned in my two weeks notice, thank you so much for the opportunity. And then just leave it at that and then be gone. But good for you for trying to find an exit strategy to that because it is not worth the stress. Because I mean, it might only be part time, but you know, if you're working there two days a week, but then you're thinking about it the other five, it might as well be a full time job. So, oh wow. Uh, let's see, Sapphire. Saffron says, my boyfriend of four plus years just broke up with me. He wasn't a narcissist, but had issues with communication and feelings. I have been depressed due to going through two family suicides in the, two, in the past two years. I'm just feeling so many things right now and so much loss. I have been depressed. I know it was an issue with our relationship on top of the inability to really communicate and deal with feelings. Well, it's my goodness. That is a lot of loss. I mean, two family suicides in two years and the ending of a four plus year relationship, that's a lot. And it's normal to have a wide mix of feelings and, and emotions about all of that. And I can imagine that you would be depressed and it's just a lot. And I don't know and I think continuing to reach out to different support, if you've got other supportive people in your life and tripling up on your self-care right now, doing what you need to do in order to take as good of care as you, of yourself as you can right now and realize that you don't need to have all the answers or that you don't even need to feel a certain way, like that it's okay to have a wide mix of emotions. Like that's just all a part of it, you know? And to just try to surround yourself with supportive people as much as you can right now. And I think to just keep, keep the awareness or the realization of um, that the pain of all of this isn't going to always feel this intense and it's not going to last forever. So I think sometimes when we go through so much grief and loss and hurt, it can just feel like we're always going to be at that place. And it can, we can start slipping into our own you know, kind of pit of despair. And so I think to kind of remember just keeping perspective. And if you've been feeling incredibly depressed and overwhelmed and just stuck and not stuck, but like really, mm, maybe stuck, feeling maybe up to your neck and, and grief, seeing about talking to other people uh, talking to a therapist, talking to possibly talking to a doctor and seeing if some antidepressants might help during this time. Um, there's different, you know, grief support groups for people that have lost loved ones to suicide that might be worth exploring. So utilizing as many of these resources around you as you possibly can. Uh, let's see, Ad Adela says, Dana, last time we discussed toxic positivity. What's your view on toxic life coaches on narcissism? Richard Grannon's last video targets society's victims, villainizing them with racist ideology. Can you explain a little bit more? I'm not, I want to make sure that I understand your question. What do you mean by toxic life coaches on narcissism? And what... Richard Grannon's last video targets society's victims, villainizing them with racist ideology. Can I guess, can you elaborate on both of those questions so I can make sure I understand?
Uh, let's see. Andrew says, do you think that once the narcissist and others see that you've begun to heal after narcissistic abuse, that the narcissist would use your healing to make themselves look or feel virtuous for letting you go? Thanks. Oh, I think, yeah. They twist. I mean, there's no end to like the ways that they will twist things. They might say, you know, I really wish you all the best or... Uh, I had to let you go. I had to protect you from me. Or um, I really hoped I played a part in your healing. <laughs> or who knows? I mean, you're you're just you're dealing with a person with a very twisted reality. So, you know, this is why going no contact or going really low contact with them and really anybody that knows them for at least a while, especially while you're still like emotionally fragile can be one of the best things that you do for yourself to really protect your sanity because it can be enraging when you hear, you know, when somebody has been abusive and then you find out that they're off championing, 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 I can't say that word, championing, championing uh, domestic violence awareness or that they're playing, you know, like the martyr or that they're trying to be sympathetic. Like it's that kind of stuff is enraging. So if you can just really limit the amount of exposure you have to that, the better off you're going to be. And yeah, that's a really great point. Natasha says, yeah, then they find you and who are you and then destroy your healing. If you see them, just ignore them. Yeah. Yep. And that's a good point too, Gigi says, uh, my estranged husband is playing this card right now. My healing and regaining strength uh, with impervious boundaries only fuels his abuse further. Yeah. Yeah, you moving on with your life to, in general tends to enrage them. And they just, they just, a lot of them get off on like just needling former targets. It's just a way, it's just that quick hit, a quick ego boost. It's, it's exhausting and it's enraging. Oh, wonderful. Natasha says, my heartache pain stopped today since Easter. I got on antidepressants from a doctor and sleep tablets. Yeah, stress can really do a number. And it's one thing, you know, when we talk about having like a broken heart or certain events really can cause us chest pain, but if it's ongoing and it's, it's heart pain, I mean, that's called angina and it's, it can, it can be a big deal. So it's important if you're experiencing really, you know, physical symptoms, especially if it's related to like your breathing or your heart, things like this to go see a doctor. So I'm glad that your, uh, your health issues result. That's, that's awesome. Okay. Let me scroll up here. Natasha says they can't give you a bad reference. That's illegal talking about the X. Oh, but you know, <laughs> it is, but they, they don't have, like, they don't care. I mean, manipulative, evil, destructive people like this, they don't play by the rules. And that's why I think it's the whole kind of thing, like, you know, be nice to your, like, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer kind of a thing, like leaving on really good terms, just kind of saying whatever you need to say in order to just get out there and limit damage because they will, they will say all kinds of things. They might, they might just be real smooth about it too. They might say stuff like, well, you know, she did put in her two weeks, but that was really, really for the best. I don't want to talk bad about her, but you know, she just had, she was just kind of difficult. I mean, I don't want to talk bad about her. That's not how I am, but you know, there were just some concerns about certain things missing. That's all I'm going to say. Just they plant seeds like that, the, the, that level of maliciousness and that 
a twisted mindset. You just never know how that stuff's going to come out. So I'm a big fan of just erring on the side of caution and getting, just trying to limit, just do damage control as much as you possibly can. And to not kick a bee's nest if you don't need to kick one. Okay. Um, and Sweetbriar saying, if you tell a boss you are giving notice to leave, be prepared to have your hours cut way down, possibly to zero immediately. You will have still left voluntarily, but some people are petty. That's a really great point. Yeah. Yeah. So keep that in mind and try to financially prepare yourself as much as possible. James asked, Dana, did the mobile you had get destroyed and are you making another one? They, certain things were trying to restore. So like my butterfly painting is, they're working on restoring that. Same thing with the mobile and I haven't heard yet. I, I think it'll be okay, but I, I, Travis just texted me the guy's phone number today. I just wanna see what's going on with that. So hopefully I'll find out soon here. Uh, let's see. Okay, let me scroll up. I wanna see if Adela answered. gave some more information here. What? I have not heard this. She says, coaches like Richard Grannon, he uses what we know about narcissistic personality disorder and abuse and suggests that minorities reactive abuse is a form of narcissism. He makes perpetrators out of victims of white supremacy. Can you, that is the first I've heard of anything like that. I would like to look into that uh, more. Is there any way that you can send me a message on YouTube with a link to that? That's, that's really surprising to me. I had not heard about that. Um, let's see here. Okay, let me scroll down. Scroll and scroll and scroll in. And, you know, speaking of, I think, kind of controversial topics, oh, oh, Diane, you know, I think I, that board, my old handwritten affirmation board in the background might be at a friend's house. So that might, I should, I need to go dig it up. I've got some stuff at some random stuff at a friend's house and see if it's there. I do. I love that board too. Gosh, that's amazing. That thing has served, that thing has survived so many moves over the years. It's, I don't know how I have hung on to it. Okay, and then up yours, Nark was saying about Richard Grant and is like, no, no, that's not what he said at all. So it sounds like there may be some uh, perception differences here. So send me the link. I'd be curious to see it. Uh, 
Um, let's see, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Oh, I was gonna say another controversial topic that I said that we would discuss here briefly this week was on MGTOW. So, and I don't remember who asked the question or if they're even here again tonight, but I feel like this is something that's important to address. So, and I hope to do, I'm not overly familiar with this topic. So set me straight if I'm, if I'm not covering it adequately. So MGTOW is an acronym, stands for men going their own way. And from what I've gathered with watching a handful of different YouTube videos on it, it's basically, and there's a wide range. Some of these videos are more for men that are just kind of fed up with the current way the system is and they're fed up with, they just don't see the value in legally in financially committing themselves to women. Some of them don't want anything at all to do with women. And then there's, you know, on the more extreme side, I would say just like flat out misogyny. And here, here's my concern with this, you know, watching all these videos and it's, to me, it seems like there really is a lot of talk about, you know, men being, manipulated, used, abused, exploited, neglected, these kinds of things. I don't deny or doubt that that happens. I've, I've seen it. I've seen a lot of, one of my, my good friends, who's no longer a good friend, her father was a very, played a very active role in my life. He was a wonderful man. He was married to a very difficult woman. And him, his wife and those two girls put that guy through hell. And so, I mean, I've seen, I've seen this. So um, I guess my thing with men is I think with, with MGTOW is when anybody starts kind of swearing off a, a group of people, if they think like all women are, are manipulative or all, even for women, like all men are manipulative and they just write off a whole gender like that my concern where I'm coming from is it's not the gender, it's the behavior. And regardless of what your thoughts are on marriage, on the government, on, you know, feminism, on any of that, I I'm concerned with you seeing the full picture of it, because if you think that, okay, well, it's just women that are the problem, then you're going to be really caught off guard by your male coworker or your male boss or, some guy in your life that then makes your life a living hell. So like my focus with this channel and everything is in, is to get people to see like the bigger picture of it. So you can best prepare yourself in any situation. However, any problematic manipulative situation comes downstream that you have, you understand how these things happen and how manipulation happens and that you're not locked into thinking like that it's, you know, like women or, you know, certain astrological signs or certain professions or certain parts of the country or certain age groups or, or what have you. Uh, let's see here. And that makes sense. General says, my wife tried to murder me. I have such a hard time trusting women right now. That makes total sense. I'm pretty sure that my ex-boyfriend was trying to murder me. So that was kind of my thing with the whole MGTOW. They're like, oh, women are really driven to get resources. They're really driven to kind of basically use men for money. And I was like, well, you know, there's a lot of gay men that message me and that come to my channel who are in this exact same situation with another man. And in my own situation, I had a guy who had targeted me for money that he thought I had. So it, it's not so cut and dry that like all women are this way or like all guys are this way. It's problematic people are this way. And it's important that we all see that kind of behavior for what it is but totally normal. And that's okay to just bench yourself and be like, you know what? Like, 
I don't trust women. I don't want to date. I'm just, I need to be alone and I need to kind of get my head straight and like, I just need time. That's, that's totally, that's a normal reaction to a very abnormal situation. But I see women do this too, though. It's real easy for women to slip into thinking like, I'm done. All men are pigs. I don't want anything to do with men. They're just all, you know, like into an extreme, some women can really go to an extreme point. That's not okay. Right. And then what tends to happen is I also see a lot of women that are like, you know what, they're, they're done with men. They swear off men. And then either and a lot of them will maybe start getting in relationships with other women. And then they're shocked that these, uh, these women can also be abusive and even more so sometimes. So it's the behavior. It's not the gender. <coughs> okay. Let me. Uh, and people are talking about the whole MGTOW thing. You know, I think everybody needs to just kind of think for themselves. If a person doesn't want to get married, here's my thing. As long as a person is open and honest about their intentions, if a, guy, a male or female is like, you know what? I don't want to get married. And like, and if we ever, or maybe I just want to have sex, like I don't want anything serious as long as people aren't leading other people on. So everybody can make an informed decision based on the truth about what's workable. I'm fine with that. If people are like, Hey, you know what? I want to be in a relationship, but I want to keep all of our assets separate. Go for it. But I think these conversations need to be had. Cause I think there are just as many women out there that are like, you know what? I don't want to get married. I don't want to share assets. I just want to keep things separate. I really like you. You're cool. But you know, like, let's just, let's just do things our own way. Like let's not do things the way that society says that we need to. So I'm all about people thinking for themselves and coming up with what works, but within the context of like open, honest, sincere, solutions oriented communication. Because one person might be, if a, you know, it's not obviously not fair to lead somebody on if they're wanting to get married and the other person's just having a good time, that's not cool. So just being being real about, you know, what what you're looking for. Uh Okay, so let me scroll up here. Natasha asks, is narcissism illegal in the US as domestic violence in court cases? Well, narcissism, if we're talking like personality disorders, like that's not legal or illegal. It just kind of is. It's more the actions of, it's the actions that a person takes that are legal or illegal. So, and here's the challenge with bringing up personality disorders, especially in court, it can really look like there's a term called pathologizing. So if if um, it can look like we're calling a person names, if we're like this person, even if you have a therapist who's like, yes, your ex sounds like a psychopath or a sociopath or a narcissist or what have you. If we were to go in and say, you know what? My therapist said, yeah, that person's a narcissist. It can, because the focus isn't on the behavior, it's on the person. It can seen, uh, it can be seen as just pathologizing them and not really helpful. So it's, it's frustrating, but keeping the focus on this is what they, this is what they did. And this is, 
you know, this is what was abusive. This is what the problem was. Dandelion Green says, yeah, I don't like man bashing or woman bashing. I agree. I don't either. I don't either. And I think the conversation about abuse in general, especially more of like the unseen abuse, like verbal, emotional, psychological abuse, that stuff's not really openly talked about anyhow. And it's not even really well understood, frankly. I mean, I used to work at a domestic violence shelter and I would say <laughs> the level of awareness is just not where it needs to be. Hopefully in the next five or 10 years, it'll greatly improve, but it's not there for women. And the vast majority of studies, of education, of outreach on for abuse in general has been to women. So this stuff's not even being, in my opinion, not even being uh, accurately, you know, um, talked about and, and all of that to women, it's for sure not being discussed and talked about as far as men go. There's still very much that that's kind of stereotype that abuse is about gender and strength and it's not, it's about power and control. And, but this stuff really flies under the radar. So it's a lot of really important conversations that need to be had and hopefully will be had on a more regular basis in the very near future. You know, my channel, even when I started my YouTube channel, you know, a handful of years ago, it was, the focus was primarily on women. That was, the, that was what I had experience with personally and professionally. And I didn't, I had no idea what men really went through, you know? And so I started, and it was when I started hearing from men, I had a lot of emails and messages and from men who were confused. They were just like, or they were upset with me. They're like, your videos are very sexist. Why do you always talk about like the man being the bad guy? And I hadn't, I hadn't realized that. And so then it was sort of one of those things, like once I knew better, I did better. And so now I definitely make it a huge point to discuss both sides of it, because there's a lot of hurting men out there that have had, you know, really abusive mothers or an abusive spouse or what have you. So it's good to open up the conversation to just talk about behavior in general. Yeah, Dandelion Green says, yes, I was girl bullied throughout elementary school. That left a mark on me of my own gender. I have since learned that both men and women have the potential to be dangerously abusive. Yes. Um, okay, let me, let me scroll down here. Shannon says, yes, my dad was an, was an abuse target of 30 plus years of marriage to my mother. You know, once I think your eyes are open to it, what, to the behavior you do, people start and people say this all the time. They're like, I'm seeing this everywhere. Like what's wrong with me? You know, am I crazy? Am I paranoid? Am I just hypervigilant due to PTSD? Like why, why am I seeing this? And the reality is more often than not, it's just that your eyes are more open to it. And this stuff has been going on forever. We just have been glossing over it, justifying it, rationalizing it what have you. And so now that we see it, we're like, oh my gosh, okay. Yeah, this is a problem. That's a good question, James. He says, Dana, can somebody else permanently forward mail for someone else? My ex still gets stuff mailed to my house. It's annoying. That's a great question. I would contact your local post office and see if they can 
put something in saying that this person no longer lives there and to hold either hold the mail for them or to just forward it for this address, but to just stop delivering it. I don't blame you. That's incredibly stressful. It's just like you kind of, you know, you're holding your breath every time you check the mail and you don't want to see your name and all of that. Oh, wonderful. Hi, Jen. She says, hello, Dana and team. I discovered you through Ross Rosenberg. I really enjoy, or I enjoy your deep, clear explorations. Just finding you live now. I'm so grateful. Thank you for your contributions. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And welcome. The live, the live, live streams are always really fun. They're just different. You know, there's a whole different, there's a whole different thing that goes on in the chat than what people see when they're watching the video after it's been recorded. Uh, let's see. Okay, that's a great question. Purple Belt says, now that I know red flags, how can I teach my 16 and 18 year old what to look for? Know your gut how to pick the right person and not give up hope because their dad and I didn't last forever. <sighs> That's such a big question. That's such a fantastic question. I think it all, I think really happiness and success in life comes from self, being self-aware and every person is different. So the more aware a person can be about what makes them them, and kind of where their zone is, the better off they'll be. It'll help them navigate. It'll help them navigate college if they go to college, or just finding a career path of any kind. It'll help them with who their friends are, what kind of relationships they enter, when to get out of a situation. Um, it just helps to navigate life in general. So I think really talking about getting in tune with themselves and getting, knowing your, your gut is a big part of it. One of the exercises that I find really helpful for people that are just kind of starting down this path is to think about things in terms of a scale ranging from zero to 10. So things that are a 10 are yes, absolutely. I love that. Like it's, I get, you get goosebumps thinking about it. You're just jazzed like that is your zone and so for some people that might be football for other people that might be music for or math or art or writing it could be any number of things in any number of ways so thinking about things in terms so zero would be ice cold like who oh, no 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 five would be lukewarm somewhere in the middle you know and then that 10 is that absolutely that's it for me and it helps to start off thinking about things on, on terms, the scale, things that you're not emotionally invested in. So for example, I have this little dove thing that I love and I just love this thing. And to me, this is a reminder to follow my peace, to like follow my, my inner, my North star, basically. This thing is a 10. I just love it. It's just so cute. And I love the meaning behind it. Uh, pens, you probably have heard me talk about this. These pilot gel pens, I love, or these ink pens, I love them so much. My favorite, new Chris, pilot uh, G2, my 07 gel, my ink pens, love these things. These are a 10. I get so much enjoyment from writing with them. Writing with a regular ballpoint pen is like a three for me. I just, I don't know, it's like nails on a chalkboard. I know that sounds weird, but I don't like that at all. I could write all day with those kinds of pens. Um, this mug, I love this so much. I love the color. I love the size. I just love the way that it fits in my hand. This is a 10. This desk is a standing desk, Ikea. <laughs> it's, I don't know, like 150 bucks. Some of the best money I've ever spent. I absolutely love it. I love how long it is. I love that it raises and lowers. It's a 10 for me. Um, 
I, well, since we had the fire, I, you know, we don't have that many things, but there were other things in my life that were not a 10 that were like a one or a three or a five. And when you start, I had this, this set of uh, stainless pans and I thought I would really like them, but every time I cooked with them, I would burn, I'd burn everything with them. And those pans used to just irritate me and frustrate me. And they were like a two. They were so frustrating. Uh, electric stoves would be something that would be <laughs> like low on the scale. Cause I burn it. I just, I don't know what my, my deal is. I cannot cook with electric. I burn everything. So that's not very high on the scale. Writing is a nine or a 10 activity for me. Uh, so at, so t turning inward and going through your closet can be another way to do this. Finding clothes, like on the scale, where is this? Like, how do you feel about, like, where would you rank these certain things? And then why it can help a person to, to become more introspective and kind of figure out how you think about, you know, where things are in your life and why, and then to start once you kind of get used to thinking about things like that, then you can start applying that, thinking about different friendships you might've had over the years, different classes, different teachers, different relationships. Once you're in tune with how something feels when it's really feels right for you and how something feels when it feels wrong for you, that's a really great start. And that can be a fun activity, I think, to do with kids, it really brings about a ton of aha moments of, wait a minute, like, why do I have this thing in my life that's a three or a five or even a seven? Like, why not? Why not go for nines or tens? And because oftentimes we might think it's money related and more often than not, it's, it's not about money. It's just making those nines and tens a priority. So... Uh, that would be one thing. I think my book, if they are open to reading or if you're open to discussing things, my book, Out of the Fog, that is where so many people get tripped up. That book really compares and contrasts a lot of different concepts between like a person being a friend and a person being friendly, uh, the difference between commitment and codependency, the difference between... Oh, I'm trying to, there's, there's like 50 that I go through, um, kind of extremes. The difference between like a person being a parent and a predator, uh, the difference, let me look, let me flip open that book here real quick. Let me see what else I have in here. Love versus love bombing. Appropriate guilt versus inappropriate guilt. Being appropriately emotional versus being overly emotional. Uh, silent treatment versus cooling down. No contact versus silent treatment. Um, I go into the cycle of a narcissistic relationship versus the cycle of a normal relationship. Uh, going through so much together versus being put through so much by another person, a person acting the part versus them actually changing, sincere remorse versus insincere remorse, uh, sincerity versus intensity. And there's just in many, many more. So these are healthy bonding versus trauma bonding. It just goes on and on. So, and we'll be discussing this book in much greater detail, not this Thursday, but next Thursday. So I think having these conversations, because I think also I cover in there forgiveness, like forgiveness, I forget what I compared that to, forgiveness versus allowance maybe. So, a lot of these concepts are, they're not taught and they're commonly confused and ha a person having these kind of blurred understandings between the two, it can just be so easy for them to just go right off track, thinking that they're doing the right thing, thinking that they're being compassionate or that they're being forgiving or, 
you know, what have you, but really they're just being lured back into manipulation. So teaching healthy boundaries, talk, not even teaching, just starting the conversation is a big thing because they're at that age now discussing, you know, what are healthy boundaries, um, what standards, deal breakers. I don't think anybody really talks about deal breakers and it's important for people to have those. It doesn't mean that they're lacking in compassion. It doesn't mean that they're a bad person or that they're mean or that they're somehow not spiritual. If they have deal breakers, deal breakers is a very important part of self care and self love and self protection. And so learning that it's okay to walk away from certain situations and, and all of this is a big, is a big part. And that'll really help set them up for success. New Chris says, Dana, have you read The Child Within by Charles Whitfield? And also you've got to read Healing from Hidden Abuse by Shannon Thomas. I have read Healing the Child Within, but it was a while ago. And um, I will add that to my list. And the Healing from Hidden Abuse by Shannon Thomas. Pin, I need a pin. And I need paper. <laughs> Let me make a list here. Uh, Charles. Shannon Thomas. Healing from hidden abuse. I can add that to the list. We still have quite a few more slots for book club for this year. Okay, so Tanitria, great question, says, I'm really having trouble with knowing a sincere apology and what is not. I mean, how do I know when they really mean it? You'll know a person is sincerely apologetic when their actions change, and that takes time. So if a person, a lot of manipulators will just say everything. Hey, you know what? I, I'm sorry. This will never happen again. I love you. I value you. I, I want to do the right thing. I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get into therapy. I'm going to go to rehab. I'm going to do whatever. And it's all just talk, 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 talk. But it's where the rubber meets the road, you know, like, okay, then you've got to actually prove it, like do the work of actual change. And that takes a while because I think as we all know, right? I mean, we all oftentimes want to change something. I would love to lose weight. I talk about it all the time and I mean it. Every single time I talk about it, I mean it. I, tomorrow things are gonna change and then things don't change. Or they, I go to the gym for like a few weeks and I fizzle out and I get so irritated with myself. So even if a person actually wants to change, the process of change, staying motivated to actually change is difficult. It's difficult for all of us. But the actions, you know, the results will show if a per how honest a person really is being with themselves. So uh, depending on what they have done, I would say it, give, give a person time to actually change and to prove it. A at a minimum, I would say probably six months of like appropriate action. And that's the hard thing though with manipulators is because more often than not, they just get better at hiding what they're up to. If a person has behavior that is like egregious, if it's showing that there's a character issue there, this isn't just, uh, you know, kind of, I don't want to say just personality stuff, but if it's, we're talking like, you know, lying, cheating, stealing, they can, are continuing to do this that shows that's, that's a big deal. Like that's a big problem. And especially if they have a pattern of doing that. So at that point, I would really get clear with yourself. on like, what are your deal breakers? How many times, how many times are you going to go through this before you just walk away and don't look back? So uh, Jennifer asks, what is the difference between love bombing and regular courting? This is a great question because I think a lot of people tend to get caught up in this and a lot of people tend to move really fast. Like that seems to kind of be the new normal. Just because a lot of people do it doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do. 
just, and I, you'll hear this from other people. They're like, well, you know, my, I met my husband and I knew on the first date I was going to marry him. And by the third date we moved in together and we got married within that first month. He is the love of my life. Things just worked out perfectly. And to, to a person who's been through abuse, I think that's their biggest concern is I don't want to miss out on that. And I want to, you know, I want to be able to love like I've never been hurt. I want to rush full speed into things. The thing is though, just because that worked out for them does not mean that's a good idea. Just like, just because somebody picked up a hitchhiker and they are now their new best friend, it does not make that a good idea. It's just, it's not a good idea to rush into something like that, especially when it's, when you're talking, I mean, combining your life with another person, it's just a good idea to go slow. So, um, a lot of people, those first stages of dating, there is that level of like idealization from both people. We all think, oh man, that person, especially if there's that connection and there's that attraction and there's that chemistry. Oh, they're so funny. They're so good looking. I just feel, I look forward to seeing them. They want to text you all the time. You want to text them all the time. It can be really easy to have that whirlwind kick up. And that's okay to a point when it becomes a problem is when people are, they're not wanting to spend time with their friends. They're calling in sick to work, to go spend time with the person. They don't have hobbies. They're making this new person, their whole world. That's when things become a problem. It's really important to keep your life, your friends, your hobbies, these kinds of things. So that relationship doesn't become your whole world. Like that's never healthy. So that relationship with that other person is enjoyable and it's like the candles on your cake, but you've already got the cake. Does that make sense? So um, with love bombing, love bombing tends to be pretty relentless. And there's, and I guess probably one of the major differences between love bombing and like somebody moving fast and dating is love bombers don't respect boundaries. So you might say, Hey, I've got to go to bed. Like I, I can't talk like this or I can't hang out this weekend or, or what have you. And they'll just keep pushing you and you might reinstate that boundary. And then they, they, again, they don't handle it well. They become defensive. They become aggressive. They just continue to push. If somebody's not respecting your boundaries and, it's, and if they're finessing you, right, if they're just kind of schmoozing you, telling you everything that you want to hear, that's a problem. Uh, tuning, tuning into yourself if you're feeling, I have found that with, when I'm around a manipulative person, and I would, my guess would be that a lot of other people are this way as well. When I'm around somebody who's finessing me, who's smooth talking me, who's not sincere, I feel like somebody took a magnet to my internal compass. I almost, nowadays, I almost get physically ill. It's like my head is spinning. I don't, I don't like, I, I don't feel centered at all. Um, I just, I feel gross. I feel just this instant like repulsion. I don't feel that way around a lot of other people, most other people. And I don't feel that way when other people are being sincere. So because of, and it can be so hard to walk away from somebody who's telling you everything that you want to hear. But if you realize, Hey, you know what? I don't feel this way around a lot of people. It's just problematic people that can help validate those feelings. And then for us to always set the pace, like if somebody is wanting you to do something that you don't want to do to just say like, Hey, no, I can't like, Hey, I'm not cool with meeting for like dinner and a movie on our first date. How about, or going to your house? Don't, don't do that. Going to somebody's house for the first date. Uh, let's go, let's meet for coffee or let's just meet for a drink. So you're setting the pace. You're not letting somebody else, especially a total stranger, setting the pace. That's important. Okay. And this is, you know, having your own life, assertive communication, you will quickly find that that really turns off uh, 
a lot of the wrong people because they realize that they can't, they're not going to get anywhere. So I know that a lot of people feel like, oh, I, I just don't want to miss out. Like, what if I miss out on like this great person because, <laughs> because I have boundaries I, is, is basically what they're saying. But what they really mean is, you know, I don't want to, um, I feel, I'm feeling guarded. I'm feeling kind of distrusting. I don't want to miss out on a good person because I have issues. That's how that's, that's how that kind of stuff tends to register, but it's not true. If you think about how do you feel around a, a lot of other people, like probably not the same way, even though you might at first, if, if you're, if you're fresh out of a situation like this and you're like, you know what, I'm to the point, like we had a guy in here earlier. He's like, you know what? I had this really awful experience. I don't trust women. And if you're at that point, that's a good sign. You just need to bench yourself and just take some time to breathe because getting back out there, dating is rough and you're, you're just gonna encounter a wide mix of people. And if, you're already, if a person's already feeling vulnerable and distrusting and just kind of disinterested in dating, then your time is better invested doing things that help to nourish your soul, basically, whatever that might be, taking up another hobby, spending time with friends, meditating, you know, reading, getting to know yourself, anything else, but trying to force to just force yourself to get back out there. Okay. Uh, okay. Beautiful. Okay. Let's see here. Yeah. Free, <laughs> free Kevin says, my narcissist would get offended if I had hobbies or interests that she didn't find interesting. It was competition. I, you know, I see, frankly, I see this a lot with men. Uh, where I don't know, it's bizarre and I don't want to get into kind of a gender thing. I'm sure that, you know, gay men have encountered this too. And women, you know, gay women have encountered this and, and, and whatnot. But I think, what I have seen is a lot of women tend to take the role of like a mother to a guy and where they will approve or disapprove of the way that he spends his money or the way the kind of um, hobbies he has or whatnot. And they really micromanage that. And that's not cool because, you know, it's everybody needs their own soil in which to grow. And so, that's a big thing. Like if somebody's trying to control, if the genders were reversed and if it was a guy doing that to a woman, we would say that it's a problem, but because it's a woman doing that to a guy, that kind of stuff often flies under the radar. So if somebody is controlling you, no matter what gender they are, that is a problem. Okay. Jennifer says another related question is what is it like when the honeymoon stage ends compared to the love bombing stage? That's a, that's another great question. So like a honeymoon, it's like a norm, we're talking like a, a normal relationship, that idealized stage, which is also known as the honeymoon stage, that tends to lead into something that people tend to kind of settle in. So they get more comfortable with each other. They, at that point, they either kind of realize, okay, we're either going to double up on our commitment or we're going to go our separate ways. Most people you're, we're not thinking clearly during that whole like idealized honeymoon stage. The other person looks amazing and that lasts probably about 90 days. It can last a little bit longer, but that's that whole infatuation period where like this person's amazing. I feel like I've won the lottery, like the relationship lottery, like they're just so great. And then we start seeing them more and more clearly. It's not so much that they've necessarily changed, although it can be with, if they're abusive, they might just do like a 180, but in a normal relationship, we might just realize, you know what? Wow. I never realized that before with them. And, Ooh, like, I don't know how I feel about that. And then we're kind of at this crossroads of like, where do I go from here? And do we keep going down this track or do we go our separate ways? But there's more of that settling in period love bombing. If it, if it has, if it's truly like, manipulative purposes. If this person's like finessing or schmoozing somebody, they usually have an end result, which is either they're trying to get sex out of a person or they're trying to get money out of a person or they're trying to get both. So after they've gotten what they're trying to get, 
that love bombing goes away. So that that, that person just moves from like that idealized stage, maybe straight to discard, or they might move more into like that devalue stage where now, you know, that the other person seeing that person clearly or more clearly, it's, it's kind of the same stuff, but it just, it's skewed. That ab- abusive mindset is so skewed. So like a normal person is if they're seeing things that they don't like in a partner, they might be assertive. They might address them. They might try to reach a solution. There's definitely, there's that mindset of like mutuality of like, Hey, I really like you, but Hey, it's really annoying when, you know, I don't know, like you don't flush (laughs) or, you know what I mean? Like, or you, I don't know, you just leave all the lights on or whatever it is. You, people bring it up and then they address it and things either people can kind of find a middle ground or they, or they don't. Uh, With love bombing, because narcissists, pathological type of people, they tend to move really fast. They're very impulse driven. There is no real like long-term anything unless it's manipulation, unless they're thinking about long-term manipulation. But if they've got their eye on the target, they're finessing them, they're schmoozing them then. And they might really think like, the same, like I've met this amazing person, but then when the reality that person sets in, the morning breath, the hair first thing in the morning, the, you know, you've got bills to pay, like the reality of the situation, anything that doesn't fit in the box that that abusive person thinks that we should think, feel, or act, they start really avidly working to like grind those sides off and they don't see a problem with it that's the problem. It's you're dealing like there's really two different mindsets out there. There's that like power over mindset, like that abusive person mindset of that. It's an entitlement. It's all about me kind of a thing. And every, everything should uh, be how I want. And they have no problem just grinding other people down in order to get what they want versus a person that has like that attitude of like mutuality of let's work as a team, let's figure things out. That those that mindset, that mutuality mindset is the only mindset that's that's workable in a relationship. So I hope that that answered that. Okay, let's see here. Okay, Manju, yes, we were going to talk about this a while ago, and then we had the fire. She says, how do we become financially stable to get away from toxic parents? So, and I still would like to look up some resources for you, but let's just talk about a few tonight. So, you know, I don't know, do you work? Do you have, do you make your own money? Uh, Do you have your own bank account? Do you have a credit card? You know, kind of where are you in, in, in that? And are you here in the US? I guess would be my other question. So let me scroll down. and see here, but so hopefully you're still here and hopefully you're answering, but um, so, okay, so here are some resources, like financial resources to kind of get you started. There's a fantastic website out there called uh, Credit Karma, creditkarma.com. It's free and it'll give you kind of a a pretty accurate, actually, estimate of your credit score from both Experian and TransUnion, which is, is probably only helpful if you're here in the US. And it'll show you all of the accounts that are open. It'll show you if you've got any like delinquent accounts or anything in collections. It'll show you how much total debt you have. 
and it updates on a fairly regular basis. They have an app that you can put on your phone and you can monitor it. So understanding your credit score and credit reporting is, is a good first step. This is, a, I think, an important thing for everybody to know, regardless of, you know, 18 and over, it's important to know. So, and then understanding kind of what things go on a credit report and what things don't. So revolving debt, like uh, a mortgage, a car payment, credit cards, those go on a credit report. Your, you know, leasing an apartment does not go on a credit report. Um, prepaid credit cards do not report to a credit report. Uh, personal loans uh, do not report to a credit report. So if you're trying to build credit, they oftentimes will look for like probably about three or so revolving lines of credit. So you can open up a credit card if you have a bank. So let's say, for example, you bank at Bank of America. That's where your checking account is. You can go in there. You can ask them for uh, that you're trying to tell them you're trying to build credit, see if you can open up a credit card with a small limit that you want to make sure that it's not like a prepaid card that you want it to report to the credit bureau every month. And then just making sure that you're, you know, you're paying it off. It does take time to kind of build credit. Uh, so just be kind of mindful of that. Um, trying to think another kind of shortcut way around that. If your credit is, is hurting. If, if you have bad credit or you don't have credit, what you can do is if you have a really good friend or family member that can help you out, ask them to put you on as an authorized user on their credit card. And then you don't need to, and I would highly recommend you don't get that credit card. So you're only on their account and name only. And what that'll do is if the, this is assuming too, that they have good credit. Okay. So if, if they have a credit card, they have good credit. If you're on as an authorized user, their good credit will also reflect good on you. So it'll, the credit bureau, it'll report to their credit as well as yours, because you're an authorized user on that account. So that can be, if you don't want to open up a bunch of credit cards, if you don't want to, um, if you're trying to raise your credit quickly, that can be a great way to do it. You can ask if you've got a couple different people you can ask that are willing to do that, that can, that can be good. You won't have, like I said, you won't have access to the card. You won't be charging up anything. You won't, you won't have the, the credit card number, like nothing. It's, um, it just, they put you on as an authorized user and that's that. So um, setting aside, if you do have income, if you do have a job, setting aside funds every month, getting in the habit in general of saving money is a good habit to get into. Putting money into a savings account, um, you know, these kinds of things. Learning how to kind of budget your money. There's another software out there, mint.com is great. There's wave accounting, which is more for, it's more advanced. Like you can use it for business, but you can also use it for personal, both of those. And they're very similar are, can be great ways. They it, like instantly import all of your credit, your um, not credit, your uh, checking and savings and credit card and student loans, all of those balances are updated. Every time you log in and you hit refresh, it'll let you know what's going on. You can categorize things. You can start, you can put together a budget. It'll tell you how on budget you are. And again, the wave accounting and mint.com are both free and credit karma is free as well. So those are some really great tools to kind of get you started. Okay, let me scroll up. Okay, yeah, new Chris is talking about love bombing. He says, I did love bomb myself as a codependent. I didn't mean to manipulate, but I definitely wanted to please. And I think that's a big difference there. It's the intention behind the love bombing. So I used to, man, I used to be the same way. <laughs> so I would really, but I, I came from a place of sincerity of, I, I, if I was really, if I really liked a person, I would let them know all of the things I really liked about them. I was also very quick to move fast. That there was, I mean, there was nothing like manipulative or 
I didn't have like a hidden agenda behind it. It just, I got caught up in like, this feels so amazing. Therefore it must be so amazing. And I would just run with it. And it took me a long time to realize, oh, that's like not healthy at all. Because again, I think a lot of this stuff, the opposite is taught, you know, you get all these whirlwind romances on TV and movies and you hear these stories. And I just kind of thought that's what it was supposed to be like. And, you know, you crash and burn a few times and you're like, wait a minute, this is nuts. Why are we doing this? Jennifer says, I guess I'm just confused as to the difference between being discarded and settling in. Well, if you're discarded, then the relationship's over. Like they kind of got whatever they wanted and now they're done. Settling in is more, I mean, there's no abuse involved in settling in. It's you become comfortable with the other person. You know that you've got morning breath. You know that you've got some crazy hair first thing in the morning. You know, you, you, you become more it kind of grows into more of like a friendship stage. Like there's still that attraction. There's still that excitement, but you're getting to know that person at like a deeper level and they're more comfortable about opening up and being vulnerable and sharing like hopes and fears and goals and dreams and who they really are. And you're doing the same. So that's not present in an abusive relationship for sure. So normal relationships, people are trying to impress other people, you know, like people are on their best behavior. And then that kind of, once people get comfortable, that kind of stuff isn't there so much. It's just, it becomes more real. Okay. Scrolling up here. Okay, Sunny, thank you for the live stream donation and a great question. She says, how do I know I'm ready to date again? Okay, great question. big question. I would say, you know, that you're ready to date again when you're not dating another person because you're lonely or scared or bored or so that's part of it. So once you've really built up a life that you enjoy, that you have friends, that you have hobbies, that you've got your own thing going. So you're not looking to somebody else to have, to build up a life for you. That's a big part of it. Um, and then also where you're able to trust, you have an idea about your deal breakers. You have an idea of, of how to be assertive. You know what it feels like when a boundary has been crossed, which feels like frustration, irritation, resentment. Those are like the early warning signs that a boundary has been crossed. You're able to bring things up to other people. You're able to walk away from a situation that falls within your deal breaker stuff. Um, no matter how you feel about another person that you're like, okay, if there's, you know, active addictions going on, if there's abuse, if there's, you know, adultery, if there's a really, if they have a really rotten attitude, like I can't have that in my life. So you realize that you're treating yourself with value, which is synonymous with self-love. So you're valuing your energy, your time, your emotions, and you just realize like, Hey, I have a lot to offer and I want to find another person that has a lot to offer so we can offer a lot to each other. And, um, and if that's not there, then this is not right for me. So that would be a good start of kind of getting that stuff down and, and learning to, and I think a big part of like learning to trust other people really comes from like learning to trust yourself. Like if you can trust yourself, if you are can, and sometimes this takes practice. Okay. So don't get upset if you don't do this perfectly right off the bat, it's kind of an ongoing evolution, but as you're moving forward and, um, you know, you're spending time with different people and ooh, sorry, that was loud. Uh, if you're, you're trusting yourself, if this is not for me, then 
I'm either going to be assertive about things or I'm going to leave. So I hope that helps. Dream says, it may feel like we attract narcissists more, but I'm starting to think they are just all around us, but they just expose themselves to us. It's like they can smell we are empaths. I think, you, I think you're right in a lot of ways that it may feel like we attract them more, but I think it's more that we're just waking up to it. I think it's always, they're, they've always been there. It's just whether or not we've seen it for what it was. I think so oftentimes we're used to glossing over this for excusing their behavior, for justifying it, whatnot. And now that you're more awake to it all, you're like, oh my gosh, like this is actually a really big problem. And, you know, a wide people are, a wide range of people are going to be attracted to you throughout your life. Like that's just how that tends to go. And some of them are going to be awesome and some of them are going to be awful. And, it's not so much about like who's attracted to you. It's more about who you're attracted to and how long you let certain people stay in your life. So don't get, I think it's so common for, and I totally get it because I've been there to get really discouraged and bummed out if they have a series, like a parade of narcissists in their life. And it's like, what is going on? I had this awful relationship and now like the next three or four relationships, it's been just really difficult, demanding, awful person after awful person. And that's why it's just going slow because every abusive or manipulative person come, can come across differently. And most of the time they do. So if they're coming across it just in it, because they come across differently, it can take us a little while. And that's, and that just can be so discouraging, especially if we're like, man, this person seems so amazing. And then boom, they do a 180 and you're like, wait, what? Like, oh no, how did I wind up here again? You know, it, it just takes time to see another person for what they are. And sometimes it takes time for, for that kind of stuff to surface in another person. So, um, just taking, taking things slow and realizing that they're out there and that, you can trust yourself. Like, you know, how stuff, how it feels when something feels off for you and that you don't always feel that way. You only tend to feel that way around other people who are minute or are manipulative or abusive. So it's not you. It's not that you're hypervigilant. It's not any of that. It's that you're just a lot more aware of what's going on now. And so you're going to approach things a little differently. I used to catch so much heat for that from so many different people that were like, you know what, you're, I used to hear, uh, you know, that's, you should just really love, like you've never been hurt before. And you, you know, that, that guy is so amazing. You know, you don't want to blow it. And uh, I had a therapist I used to work with who once told me he had, he knew my situation and he's like, but yeah, but you got to trust sometime. And that really stuck with me when he said that. And I, and I thought long and hard about that. And I came to the conclusion that, um, no, actually I don't. That was where I had been going wrong. And that's, and that was also why I felt so broken because I didn't instantly trust people like I used to. The old me took other people at face value immediately and was very quick. I just, I really, it's scary to think about all of the situations that I was in that could have gone so bad. And it was just dumb luck that they didn't, but you know, other people are other people. And it, it's so easy for us to project our own morals and values onto other people. And I think everybody does that. So it's important to realize that we have an appropriate level of trust when it's been appropriately earned. And so that we're not thinking that it's, and this, this is especially the case if somebody has something in common with us, it's so easy to think, oh, well, okay, if this person is, you know, the same religion, 
then therefore we should, we should, especially the religion, we share the same morality. They say that they're a Christian and, you know, but they, I don't, they really, I don't know if they act like it, but here we are thinking, well, they said that they're Christian. And so therefore they must not lie and cheat and steal or, or what have you. But there's lots, I mean, there's lots of people running around saying that they're Buddhist or Christian or Muslim or Jewish or you name it that do all kinds of things. Same thing with, uh, especially in like the vegan vegetarian community where somebody is like, oh, I'm vegan. And people are like really quick to think, oh, okay, that person is super compassionate. They're an empath. They're, they're safe. I can trust them completely because they seem like a really caring, compassionate person. There's lots of abusive people that are vegan. So it's, it, it's just really hard to see this stuff clearly, you know, um, just going slow. We just got to go slow. That's the only way around it. And if you get tangled up with another one, I think what you'll find too, is as you go out there and you're dating and you're meeting new people in these situations, this problematic behavior does tend to arise. You'll get so these people won't drag you through hell. Like they did before. You're not going to spend as long of a period of your life being dragged along. Like you're going to see it for what it is. And it might take you a few months to see it and then get out. But every single time you have these experiences and you're learning from them, them you're going to, you're going to shorten that cycle the next time. And then the next time and the next time, and you're just going to keep getting better at getting more in tune with yourself and, and your deal breakers and reading other people and reading their behavior and all of that. Yeah. Stacy is saying, she's like, I also experience physical pain when I'm around toxicity too long. So now I just leave. Yeah. That, you know, and I, I keep mentioning this. I just, this is one of those points I really hope to hammer home for people is, is, um, one of the biggest game changers in my life. And I think it can be a big game changer for you too, is we so often want concrete proof of something being a problem. And that's really dangerous. And we think, but yeah, but how do we know for sure? How do we know for sure that that person is actually manipulative or actually abusive? Or how do we know for sure that's really an online dating scammer? But if, if, we need to wait around until we actually get hurt in order to get that validation, then we're waiting too long. And so if you can back things up to the point of tell it, making it your new standard of, you know what, I don't do perpetual confusion. I don't do mental anguish. I don't do feeling uh, physically ill when I'm, when I'm around somebody or I don't do like feeling like the, somebody took a magnet to my internal compass. Like any of those feelings, that's, those are big signs that alone isn't worth it. Like it's not worth being in a situation if you're having such a, a visceral reaction to being around them. So just, and you don't even need to figure out, is it them? Is it me? Whatever. Just that alone is not, it's time to, to back yourself up and to get some, some distance from that person, because more often than not, it's them. You don't tend to, we don't tend to feel that way around good, solid people with sincere intentions. It's only when we're encountering a bunch of squirrely stuff, things that don't add up that we start feeling confused like that. Uh, Okay. Mm, scrolling up, scrolling up here. Okay. So Manju says, my dad tries asking me how much I have in the bank and tells me that they are family. So I should trust them. And it just scares me so bad. Okay. So you are working. I'm working more hours to make more money. Uh, 
Uh, I save loads of money always. Okay, good job. Okay, she says, how many credit cards do you need and which credit card companies do I go to? So generally for a credit report, they, they're looking at three revolving lines of credit. But like I had mentioned, if you have a good friend or a family member that you do trust, that's willing to be able to put you on as an authorized user. And again, they don't give you the card. They don't give you the number to the card. They don't, nothing. And you're not responsible for their debt. You're just an authorized user on the card, okay? So it's not a joint account. That can count as one of the lines of revolving credit for you as far as your credit report is concerned. So if you already have a bank, you can go there and ask them, say, hey, I'd really like to open up a credit card. This is my first one. Uh, I'm trying to build my credit score. And sometimes they will, Some most banks will allow you to open up. They might suggest, oh, we can open up, which, which would you like, a MasterCard or a Visa? And you can open up both. So you can open up a MasterCard and a Visa. Just make sure that it's not prepaid or that it's a debit card. You want it to be a, a full out credit card. So it's reporting to the credit bureaus. Debit cards don't report to the credit bureaus. Even though they might have that MasterCard or Visa logo at the bottom, they don't report to credit bureaus. So um, you can get two credit cards at your bank with whatever limit that you're comfortable with. And then, you know, obviously use the card responsibly, that kind of thing that can help when you're looking around at credit cards online. Uh, you know, you might want to open up one if you travel a lot, or if you're wanting to travel a lot, you can open up like a Delta sky miles type card in depending on how you plan on using it. You just want to look at the, the interest rate on the credit card. Um, you know, because that, that can rack up quickly if you're not paying it off. And as far as people asking you how much money you have in the bank, one of the, what, something that you can always tell them is you can just say, oh, I've got enough and just kind of leave it at that. Or I'm doing okay. You can always kind of spin it around too, if you're, especially if you're not comfortable talking to your parents about this for whatever reason. If, that, if they just don't feel emotionally safe to you, you can say something like, uh, you know, um, oh, I, you can maybe try to make a joke about it. Oh, you know what? I've got more than some and less than others. Or I'm working on, working on getting more money in there, dad, and just kind of letting it drop. Or if he asks you for specifics, just say, I don't know. I'd have to go check. Just stay vague, but you don't, nobody needs to know how much money you've got in the bank, really. I mean, unless, unless you're married, you know, but your parents, I parent, you know, I don't know the dynamic with your parents, but uh, it's, if you're an adult, that's, that's your stuff. Okay. Yeah. That's what I kind of figured. She says, yeah, I'm, Okay, so I have a Wells Fargo card, uh, just a checking account only. I do work, so I'm working on bettering my future so I can leave my family forever. They are just so damn toxic. Yeah. So you might be interested in, if you have a, you know, I think everybody, has, pretty much everybody has a smartphone these days. You can get the app on your phone for Credit Karma. And that's a great way to track your score. It doesn't count against you when you go, and you go to open up a credit card or you go to apply for a car loan. Car loan is something else that counts. It's a revolving line of credit. It can help build your credit score. I'm not a fan of people getting into a lot of debt in order to build their credit. So, but if you already have a car loan and it's in your name, then that's on, gonna be on your credit report. Uh, whenever your credit is pulled, so if you're applying for a lot of different loans and such, they're going to, they're going to pull your credit and look at it. That count that will lower a person's score. Your score will bounce back from that within like 30 to 60 days, but that's just something to kind of keep in mind. Uh, credit karma. I just love, I really do love that website. They, they, you can go in there multiple times a day if you want and keep refreshing it and just checking on stuff and, and it'll let you know at a glance 
like when it was last updated, when it was last reported, it'll show you, did your score go up? Did it go down? These are some negative things that are affecting your report, things that need, you need to take care of or, or what have you. So that's a really great tool to, to utilize. Plus the, the credit karma thing too, I think it's good for, for everybody to have because you can see if somebody has used your credit or if you, if you are married and you've got joint debt, all of that'll show up on there. So you'll know. So then there's not going to be any surprises where you think, think everything is fine or that you guys have a certain amount of debt and you go to get a different car or you go to apply for an apartment or a house or what have you. And you find out, Oh my goodness, I have $43,000 in credit card debt. I didn't know about where, when did this happen? So it'll, it just, it's, uh, it's just a great tool. And Jen had mentioned credit unions are very helpful in rebuilding. Yes, they tend to be the most understanding. So if you have, uh, um, you know, bad credit going to a credit union, they tend to work with a person more than a, a regular bank. Okay, let's see here, let me scroll up. Lauren says, what do you think about being married, but living in separate places? I'm not married, but I love living alone. And if I do get married, I want to live in separate places. I just need my space. Is this healthy? I think, <laughs> I think it would be difficult to be married and, and have two different houses. I mean, you could always, I require a lot of space as well and a lot of downtime and a lot of just alone time. So I, I can totally relate to that. If you can have a place, well, and a partner that understands that and isn't doesn't feel ignored or turned off by that, I think there's just kind of that, that give and take of, hey, you know what? I just really need a certain amount of downtime a day. Nothing to do with you. It's 100% me but then let's schedule time where we are spending time together. So the other person is feeling, you know, loved and significant and, and what have you. Uh, if you have a place too, that's big enough for people to have kind of have their own space where you can go retreat to, you know, some sort of room, uh, then it just gives people a breathing room. I think it can be a lot more difficult if you're in a small space with another person that can, especially if you are kind of an introvert and, you know, that can be really be difficult. James says, yeah, credit karma rocks you. Yeah, it really does. I agree. Yes, that's a great pointer, Jennifer. She says, something that might help you temporarily uh, is to go away to school. It will help you in the long run to make more money and it will help you immediately to get away. You might not be fully independent, but it's a start. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people like once they hit 18 or even a certain age where they just end up, they end up joining the military, they end up going they apply to schools that are either like a couple hours away or even in another state just to get away. And it's more of like a socially acceptable way to get distance from family. But yeah, it can be worth it. Okay, let's see. Let me scroll down here. Dream says, I don't want to be mean. I'm okay with being nice, I'm, but I'm just sick of being taken advantage of. My boundaries are way stronger now, though. Yeah. It, and I think, 
you know, because this stuff isn't taught and it's not discussed. And I think everybody thinks they have decent boundaries, but until they're pushed. And then even then we're not aware that we have poor boundaries or that we don't know how to have healthy boundaries until things get really out of hand. And then it's like this huge wake up call of, you know, how did we get here and how do we get out of being here? So, uh, and I think oftentimes I, and I, I have talked about this before. I'm a really big believer in that healthy people, uh, healthy people get that way. You have to go through the fire in order to become healthy. I think a person can be born into a wonderful, loving, supportive home. I think that's fantastic. Definitely gives a person kind of a, a leg up in many ways, as far as, you know, having healthy relationships role modeled for them. But if the discussion about boundaries and standards and deal breakers and knowing yourself, if that stuff isn't talked about, which I really, it's, I've, it's not in most, the vast majority of homes, or it's not, or it's talked about in kind of a dysfunction, an unintentionally dysfunctional way, then that those people really aren't healthy. It's just that they haven't gotten tangled up with manipulators. So, and anybody can be a target of a manipulator. And so, yeah, being aware of like, wow, okay. Um, I need to really work on boundaries and how do I, where does that, where do I start with that? And all of that, it's just kind of this big journey, but it's a big journey into self-awareness and it's a journey worth taking because it can really, it will radically change your life for the better. And it's so eye-opening because normally people come to these types of channels because they had this one relationship where things went really, really south and they, they're in a tremendous amount of pain and they're trying to get answers. But as time progresses, then they start to realize they're like, you know what, actually, I've had a few of these in my life with maybe family or with friends or with other people that they've dated. And then they start seeing like, actually, no, this has maybe been going on for a while. It's just never gone on to like this degree before. And so, you know, it's just, it's a shock to the system. And, and here's the thing too, a lot of people, when they have had their boundaries pushed and, and they are to that place where they're like, you know what, I'm angry, I'm hurt. I just have a hard time trusting. I don't want to trust. I'm just tired. I'm tired of that. There's a stage in boundary development called fortressing. It's very common, totally normal and natural and understandable. If a person's been really wounded or continues to be wounded and trusting all the wrong people and being taken advantage of, they start to really build walls. And those walls can become really, really high. That's a normal stage in, in kind of getting your sea legs as far as boundaries go. And then over time, if you're learning about boundaries, if you're learning the signs, like, what, what actually is a healthy boundary and what is a, an unhealthy boundary and what is a weak boundary and, and what does that result in and how does it feel? That's probably the best indicator of kind of where you are with your boundaries is that's the best thing about our feelings is they kind of let us know it's, it's one of a handful of ways we can interpret our environment around us. So if you're feeling like resentful, angry, frustrated, taken advantage of, um, you know, irritated, these kinds of things, those are some really clear signs that there's been, that your boundaries have been violated. And so the more you learn about, okay, how can I address this in like an assertive way or how you just, you're learning about all of this, then interacting with other people becomes much easier. You're able to see these problematic people for what they are. You're able to get out of these situations much earlier without so much damage being done. Yes, and Dream says, yes, we must accept that we are naturally kind, but we should not put up with any kind of abuse or disrespect. Absolutely. Kindness does not need to equal weakness. And I think some of the most empowered, self-actualized people out there are the ones that are able, they're kind, they're compassionate, but they have healthy boundaries. And I think what you'll find too, as you continue going down this road of like self-awareness and boundaries and standards and deal breakers and all of this stuff, 
the healthier you get, you're going to start looking around and you're like, my goodness, there are a ton of people in this world, like a ton that have no clue that have terrible boundaries and they'll give you all kinds of terrible advice. And they'll say, oh, well, you need to forgive that person because you're Christian and you need to let that person stay in your life because they're your mother. And uh, that person said they were sorry. So you got to take them back. There's all kinds of just this well-intended bad advice floating around out there. And that's what I was saying. Like healthy exists on the other side of that fire because all of that advice is fantastic until it's not. And if they've never been around, if they've never experienced the until it's not, they don't realize how kind of fragile that advice is and how contextual it really is because everything, when you're dealing with a manipulative or abusive person, that's a game changer. So all standard advice needs to really be clarified when you're dealing with somebody who's dangerous or destructive. And those of us that have gone through it, we start to see that we're like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like I don't need to just trust other people, you know, just to trust them. Like that's something that's earned. That's not just something that's freely given. Like that doesn't mean that I have issues. That means that it's ridiculous to just totally trust somebody that I don't know. Like that's not healthy, you know? So... Yes, absolutely, Dream. He says, I I tell myself that I must treat myself with kindness and that if something is hurting, I must stop it or them. Yes, if if something is registering as hurt, that's a big sign that you need to distance yourself physically or emotionally or both from that person or from that situation until you can get clarity and then regroup. And this was another... This is something that I I encourage people to do on a regular basis is to make your safety and sanity a priority. So if somebody is dangerous or destructive, if they're causing damage in your life, if you're feeling your sanity, like you're feeling perpetually confused, you're feeling that mental anguish, you're feeling continually introspective. Is it them? Is it me? I don't know. Do I have issues? Is it them? All of that. Normal situations don't have that, healthy situations don't have that kind of uh, rehashing of things and that level of introspection that goes on and that level of confusion. And the safety, if you're feeling like, you know what, or maybe even thinking about people in terms of like, are they emotionally safe? And that might be like a a pretty binary thing, like either they are or they aren't, if, if their behavior is really extreme. Uh but sometimes it also might be contextual. So some, you might be like, you know what, man, my mom is so great in so many ways, but she, there are things like, like just, she's not emotionally safe to share certain things with. So like, maybe you can't share certain things like your career choices or your sexual orientation or your, um, hopes and dreams. That's a big one. Hopes and dreams with certain people. You're like, man, this cool, this person is so cool. I enjoy their company so much. I can share so much with them, but man, I can't share my goals with them because every time I do, they try to talk me out of it. Maybe, and they're not even hurtful. Maybe they're well-intended, but they're not emotionally safe because this like totally rattles my course by sharing these things with them. So that kind of takes its own level of getting used to and kind of navigating. Yeah, Kevin says, make your safety and sanity a priority. It's very applicable to people pleasing. We've got to put yourself first. Yeah, you really do. Jennifer says, if you're registering something as hurt, but that person either quote unquote, didn't mean it that way. Is it okay to talk about it? Or would you suggest distancing first? I think it depends on what they did. And I, and frankly, I think that you'll get the kind of the clarity that you're looking for uh, if you address it with them. So let's say somebody, I don't know, says something that hurts your feelings. Okay. 
and and you mention it to them like hey that you know that really hurt my feelings and they tell you oh you can't take a joke i you know they continue to minimize it which a lot of people do okay that's very common but if you if if they say oh well you can't take a joke or that's on you or or what have you just be like i can take a joke but to me that wasn't funny so like please don't quote unquote joke with me like that anymore because it hurts my feelings if they continue to push on then it just it's a sign like they're not getting it and they're going to continue to violate that boundary with you because they don't have the insight or that emotional awareness to understand how they're what they're doing is wrong and not okay. And some people, you really have to spell it out with them. You know, like, for example, like with my mother, <laughs> she has made over the, the, you know, 40 years I've been around comments about my weight and I've always let it slide. It's always just hurt my feelings. And I've, my weight has fluctuated radically over the years. Um, so it's, and it's always comments if I'm too thin or if I'm too heavy or whatnot. And I never, it never really, I guess, dawned on me to bring it up to her, but this last time I did. And I also, (laughs) she was actually very good about it. She was like, I'm really sorry. That wasn't okay. I don't know what I was thinking. It won't happen again. And I had to make it very clear to her. I said, you know, I know that these comments are coming from a place of concern with you, because I really do believe that is the case. But given our history, my weight is never going to be a topic of conversation between us. <laughs> like it's never going to go over well with me. So my brother might bring it up and that would be okay because we don't have that dynamic. Just like somebody could tease you about, I don't know, your nose or your ears if it's somebody that you have a history with or somebody who's just kind of being a jerk about it, it's not okay. But maybe you and your best friend, maybe she's got a big nose too. I don't, I don't even know if you have a big nose. I'm just saying, but like, if she's got a big nose too, and you guys joke about it, then it's like, it, it, it's just different. Right. So sometimes it's not like a one size fits all. It's just with certain people. You're like, you know what? This conversation doesn't feel like it's not comfortable for me. And this feels Like, I don't want to, like, let's just not bring this up. Like, let's just not talk about that. But if they keep pushing, then you'll have to figure out, okay, how many times am I going to continue to to address this before I need to start doing something different? Okay. Okay. And Jennifer, that makes total sense. She says, it's hard for me to tell who's a narcissist and who I'm just being overly protective of myself with. And, you know, it might help. It it might help to not think about problematic behavior in such kind of black or white terms. It's very common for people once they get out of an abusive situation and they hear the terms like narcissist or sociopath, and they start carving up the world in terms of like normal people or narcissists. And then they become very focused on, okay, well, I'm feeling unsafe around certain people, but I need to know like if they're a narcissist, because if they're a narcissist, then that means that this is indeed a problem and I need to walk away. And then that, here's the problem with, with this, that kind of black or white thinking. It's also called like dichotomous thinking, false dichotomies like that. It's either one thing or it's another tend to lead to false conclusions. So if we're saying, okay, this person's a narcissist, then it's like, okay, this person is indeed a problem. But if they're not a narcissist, then it must not be a problem. And I think that might be where you're getting kind of tangled up. So if you can think about it in terms of we don't need to figure them out, but it's more important that we turn inward and in you for, for you to figure yourself out. So if you if you are in this and this takes practice, okay? But if you're you're getting clear on your understandings on your deal breakers and things, 
if you've gotten to the point where you're like, you know what, perpetual confusion, bringing, if you can, if, if assertive communication can't fix it, then that's a problem. Whether or not they're a narcissist or a quote unquote normal person, if you setting boundaries with somebody and saying, hey, you know, no, I can't, if you disagreeing with them, if setting boundaries with the problem causes conflicts, if you disagreeing with them enrages them or causes a silent treatment, if uh, um, you know, assertive communication doesn't clear up the confusion, then like any one of those three things is a problem. They, relationships require work, but they shouldn't be that much work. So, you know, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if the person is in, intentional about this or, or if it's unintentional, if they just lack kind of the emotional maturity to have a healthy relationship, either way, it's just, it's not going to work. And for us to be, try to be there and be like, okay, well, I'm just going to teach this person. That's an exercise in crazy making and futility as well. And that also tends to go over like a lead balloon because most people, you know, don't want to be somebody's project. Like, you know, so just keep reminding yourself, like, you know, you know, when things feel good and you know, when things feel bad and if you're addressing stuff and stuff doesn't change, then that's kind of, that's the clarity that you're looking for. Can you explain Diane? Diane says, can boundaries be like individualistic? I'm going to answer I'm just going to run with that. Okay. And you, you set me straight if I'm going off track here. I think all boundaries are very, they're very, very individual and they're very much a flex, reflection of you and where you're at in your life. So just how I was talking about certain topics of conversation might be okay for between me and Travis or me and, and some friends and maybe not okay between me and my mom. It's not the top the topic of conversation necessarily, it's the dynamic. Like that does not feel emotionally safe for me to have certain conversations. So I choose not to have them with, it's just not gonna ever go over well. So I choose not to have them with her. Uh, how I might joke with my friend is gonna be different than how I joke with my mother or my father. Um, what might feel, and your boundaries, once you're in tune with really with how certain situations feel, that's going to continue to give you the feedback that you're needing. So you're going to continue to uh, being uh, adjusting these boundaries on the fly. So, you know, you might have a coworker that is continually just walking into your office and sits down and just starts talking to you. And Maybe you don't really care for that coworker too much, right? So that feels like a boundary violation, but you might have, you might work with a coworker that you really enjoy and they come into your office all the time and sit down and start talking to you and you really look forward to that. It's, it can be very situationally dependent uh, or it can be more of a cut and dry thing. Like one of my rules is uh, I started turning off my phone. You know, I, I think I started at like 10, nine or 10 o'clock at night. And told people, I'm like, I am going to just turn my phone off. I turn it to silent. And I just, I, I like, back then I would normally spend some time reading before I would go to bed. I'm like, this is my time to just wind down and just kind of regroup. And that was just a blanket thing. So people just knew, like Dana's phone's off. If you call or text me, I'll get back to you the next day. But like, you know, I'm not going to. Because at the time I was having people that were texting or calling around the clock and then I was getting upset and then they were getting upset that I was getting upset. And it's like, dude, it's midnight or it's two in the morning. And I know you're in crisis, but like, I got to get to bed. I got, I got to go to work in the morning. So it just takes some, some navigating and some, and I think some kind of game day or post game day analysis of like, okay, that was how I thought I needed to handle it that didn't work 
or that didn't work as well as I would have liked it to. So now I needed to do something different. And you're just continually kind of reevaluating this stuff. And at first it can feel like a lot of work and it can feel really exhausting, but then over time it, it tends to become, you know, pretty effortless where it's like, yeah, this is just, yeah, you know, it's just, it's so no big deal. I guess just very much a part of you. So Okay, let's see here. Uh, let me scroll up here. Dream says, I literally have to force myself to trust my judgment and memory. Being psychologically abused, like gaslighted is no joke. I agree. It is no joke. And it really can really just erode a person's sense of reality and their perception of events. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with writing stuff down. I'm a big fan, especially if you're dealing with one person who's done a lot of gaslighting. Um, if you're trying to remember to like why you can't have them in your life to make a list of all of the reasons why, so you can go back to it. And it's hard. It's hard to, to learn to trust your judgment again. That definitely takes practice and really getting deeply grounded within yourself. There's a concept when we were talking about it earlier tonight, and that comes from the book Psychopath Free. And he talks about this concept of a constant of like finding that safe person in your life. And using that as your kind of, as just your, your reminder and as your gauge of like how you feel around safe people. So for me, my constant is my brother. Like he's a, I, one of my favorite people. I absolutely adore him. Like I know he's in my corner. Like he's just a solid, decent dude. And so if some, especially if a guy, like if a guy does something weird if I, I mean, I've been dating Travis for a while, but before when I was dating other people, like if I encountered something squirrely or weird, I would ask myself, I'm like, what would my brother do? Or like, what would he think of if I were to forward these texts onto him, you know, or would he treat a girl this way? Like, you know, and that was, that just reminded me of like, no, I don't always feel this way. Like I don't always feel confused and like disoriented. And like, I doubt my judgment. It's only tends to be around problematic people and problematic situations. And that's, I thought that was one of the best tips out there is that concept of, of a constant. Mm. Oh, Jennifer, that says, I've been going on no contact with my father for five years now. And in therapy that whole time, my sister was very angry with him when I first came out about my abuse, but it slowly dissipated. On Father's Day, right before I left for work, she sent me a picture of all of us together on our graduation day and told me about how sad she is that she can't, that she can't wish him a happy Father's Day because he'll be sad. Hmm. So now why can't she wish him a happy Father's Day? Is she no contact with him as well? That's, oh, I could see how that would be really hard if, um, either way, either way, because it's like, yeah, you know what? I'm really sad too. Like, I'm really sad too that I don't have a good dad. You know, like he really violated my trust and I have to grieve the loss of that. Have you addressed any of that stuff with her? And like, I know you're sad, but I'm sad. I'm sad that we don't have the dad that we thought we did. Shannon says, yeah, the rage or the silent treatments. I'm not willing to do those types of relationships again. That's good. Cause there's, there's just nothing there. Like that stuff is so over the top and unnecessary.
Okay, let's see. Oh, well, good. Manju says, I love being here. Thank you, universe, for bringing me here tonight. I needed to hear all of this. Well, good deal. And I hope you keep keep us posted or keep me posted on how things progress. And, you know, you're going to be making some pretty big strides to really come into that that next chapter of being a, an adult and being an empowered adult. So it can be a little bit of a bumpy road, but uh, I'm excited for you. Okay. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Um, let's see here. Lots of stuff going on in the chat. Oh, Jennifer says, no, my sister still talks to him. That's why I didn't understand what she said. I wonder if she meant that she was sad that you weren't going to call him and that he was going to be sad for that reason. If, and if that, if that is the case and it is okay for, to have that conversation, it might be uncomfortable and she might get upset about it, but just to say, you know what? I really don't want to talk about dad. Like, I know that you still talk to him, but how he treated me is within my deal breaker stuff. And I don't, I don't want to discuss them. So I love you. And I still want to talk to you if that is the case, but let's, can you please not bring him up again? Like it makes me really angry and it's just, there is not going to be any benefit to that and see how, see how she handles, handles that. And there's probably a big degree of denial on her end. And a lot of, a lot of kids of abusive parents, a lot of people in general just have terrible boundaries. You know, it's this idea of like, oh, well, family's forever and we got to forgive. And oh my goodness, you know, he was really damaged and he was hurt as a child. And so then therefore we should just, I guess, allow this to continue. And, and, you know, he abused you and, but you need to be the, the bigger person and, you know, um, all of that garbage. It's just, it's so revictimizing. So, you know, you need to do what you need to do in order to keep peace in your life and stay safe. If there's somebody that's caused you such horrific harm in the past, then they're not a safe person. And, you know, she's, it's sad and it's sick that she is still in contact with them. So... Let's see here. Good. Dream says, I've, I've come a long way with trusting my judgment. That's awesome. That's awesome. I'm happy for you. That's huge. I think that you'll find when you're on the other side of this, when enough time has passed and the dust is kind of settled and you're working towards kind of building this new normal in your life. I think what you'll find is that you have just such a heightened sense of self-awareness, you know, cause you're just so much more in tune with yourself and with other people and you're seeing them clearly and you're not justifying or excusing behavior, any of that stuff. And I wish that there were some better ways that we could all learn those lessons but if there is some sort of, um, you know, benefit or like nugget, I guess, little golden nuggets that we can dig out of this whole situation, it would be that, 
is just that level of self-awareness of learning about self-love and boundaries and standards and deal breakers and all of that stuff. Really, really learning that is huge, huge. And that will serve you and benefit you for the rest of your life. Not saying that what you went through was somehow okay or um, not trying to minimize that. So please don't get me wrong, but we can still squeeze out a lot of things from it and make it work for our, our highest and best good. Susan says, oh, thanks, Dana. I hadn't thought of turning my phone off. That might help me be calmer at night. Seriously, I have found that I, I, no, granted, I don't have children. So it's probably different with people that have, you know, minor children, but I keep my phone off all the time. And I have found I am so much calmer because of that. I'm no longer in reactive mode. So there's a few things that I do that I think help really help to keep peace in my life. I don't watch the news. That's a big one. That was kind of hard for me to let go of. I quit watching the news probably, I mean, it's been a while, like seven or eight years ago because I was feeling so anxious and I was like, I cannot handle this. And, um, I don't, well, I don't really watch TV. I watch like YouTube. I, I'm very selective. Like I watch YouTube shows and I'll watch some stuff on Netflix, but I don't, and I don't watch stuff that upsets me. So I, and I get criticized a lot for that. People are like, oh, but you live in your bubble and you need to know about, you know, all these different events and current events and this kind of stuff. And frankly, what I have found is other people will talk about it and then I'll find out about it. So I just, if you're already feeling anxious and, you know, easily upset and ruffled, exposing yourself to more of that stuff just tends to make things worse, not better. So it's, it's just not helpful more often than not. Uh, well, that's a good question. Dream asks if you are dealing our timer, if you are dealing with an anxiety disorder, how many years should you go to therapy for? Uh, years is a long time. And I know everybody kind of needs to go to therapy for different lengths of time. But I would say it's more about, are you learning, what kind of coping methods are you learning and what kind of coping methods are you actually applying? Because I think oftentimes people, and I get it, I mean, I've been there too, people go to therapy and they'll vent about something and they might get some tools or strategies, but then they don't really apply them or they forget to apply them or they only apply them a part of the time. So a lot of, a lot of anxiety, dealing with anxiety is is going to be doing things differently. So if you have an anxiety disorder and some of it too is going to be lifestyle stuff, like cutting out caffeine is a, will play a big part in that. And I know that's fighting words for like a lot of people, but it makes a huge, huge difference. That alone can get rid of a person's anxiety disorder, just cutting out caffeine. It's amazing how many, how much, we don't give credit to caffeine for the stimulant effect that it has. And if a person's already feeling all riled up, you know, having a cup of coffee can really send them over the edge. That's the other thing too, like portion size, people are like, oh no, but I only drink a cup of coffee a day. If you're like me and you drink a cup, this is probably, I mean, easily 18 to 24 ounces. This is not a cup. This is really a, a cup of coffee is about eight ounces. So this is, you know, three or four times that, and that's a lot. So cutting out caffeine, uh, being aware of kind of what is overstimulating you, news, upsetting things, um, you know, these kinds of things really can, can get a person going. Um, practicing different coping skills, uh, is, is huge. So some people only need a few sessions to just kind of get some basic skills and to just start doing things different. And some people need more than that. 
So it just kind of depends on, on what you're doing or what's going on with you. Lauren asks, what are some of the best questions a therapist has asked you that has helped you grow the most in dealing with all aspects of toxic abuse? I, to be honest, I really have not had the best luck with therapists in general. I've, I've seen a few that were absolutely wonderful and intelligent and um, great. I did not get the clarity or the validation or the strategies that I needed to, to handle what I was going through. It still felt really fantastic to just sit there and be able to talk to a person that was emotionally safe. That was worth it in and of itself. Just being able to, to vent to somebody was, was really helpful, but I don't, please don't, you know, a therapist, finding a good therapist out there is, is a lot like finding a, any good professional in any field. I mean, 10% are worth their weight in gold. 10% are absolutely awful. 80% fall somewhere in between. And it can take a few visits of going to a few different ones to really find somebody that you click with. And especially when with emotional and verbal abuse, like in boundaries and all of this stuff, uh, it's, it's just really hard to find somebody that understands this stuff to the, to the level that they need to. So I feel like not, I feel what happened with the vast majority of clarity that I got as far as like great questions and like aha moments for me came from support groups. That was when everything began clicking. And I was, man, I was trying everything. I was reading all kinds of books. I was going to therapy. I was doing everything that I thought would help. And I just, the needle wasn't moving and I just couldn't figure out what was wrong or what I needed to do or any of that. So it was support groups. That was, that was the eye opener for me. So I think, uh, so to answer your question in that way, probably the biggest uh, aha moment that I had from a support group was the whole concept of um, kind of like an empty bucket. So it was just that realization that, um, you know, I had been walking around for so long in my life, feeling very unloved and unimportant and because of that, I was very primed to just eat up that love bombing. And I had, didn't realize that I had was walking around feeling so unloved and unimportant. So when I realized that, that I had that emotional need that had been unmet for so long. And like, that was what was driving a lot of my behavior, a lot of my behavior with friendships, with relationships, that was, it was just like the, the this light bulb moment. And it was an absolute game changer. I, so many things made sense. And I began really radically changing how I was interacting with other people. Like I was that moment. I then saw love bombing for what it was. Like, it was just like everything made sense. So that was one of the, probably the biggest aha moments for me because I did not understand how uh, being charming, being cares, like all of these traits that we normally associate with that are ideal, right? Like, oh, this person's so likable and funny and intelligent and charming and all of this stuff. I didn't see how that could be a problem. But I also wasn't making the distinction between you know, uh, somebody who was really likable and somebody who was like finessing me, you know, or schmoozing me. So then once I realized, okay, yeah, there is a difference here. Like, and that's why that's not working is because this person is just coming on too strong and they're telling me everything I want to hear and I keep falling for it. So I will tell you, Dream says, I think my therapist acts like she doesn't know sociopaths are around us all. She might really not know that. I know that sounds crazy to say, 
but there's a lot of people, you know, I used to be a psychiatric nurse. We used to deal like the vast majority, actually all of our patients were either mentally ill or personality disordered. And I would say a good percentage of them were diagnosed as antisocial personality disorders. So sociopaths and psychopaths. And the kind of common mindset was like, oh, you know, hurt people, hurt people. These are just damaged baby birds with a broken wing. And they're not that bad because they don't come across, unless you're on the receiving end of it, they don't come across that bad. They come across like normal people until you find out, oh my God, like this person, you know, has been to jail for some like really horrific things or, you know, whatnot. So I think if anything, there's this attitude of a lot of mental health professionals of uh, that sociopaths, you know, they're just baby bird with broken wing. They're just misunderstood. Our love can fix them. They just need somebody, you know, to care for them and that they'll be different. Like there's a, there's like a gross misunderstanding of this kind of behavior. I actually had a therapist comment on one of my videos one time, um, basically that I was wrong about narcissists and sociopaths and that, you know, it had been his experience that when he was seeing them as patients or clients, that they weren't that way at all. And he's like, are you sure that you don't have borderline personality disorder? Because you seem to really be very dramatic about their behavior was basically the gist of his message to me. And I get where he's coming from because had I not lived it, I would have probably felt the same way. Like, no, 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 you're just being drama. Like, these people aren't like that. But I, so I had messaged him back and I was like, you, you have to realize that how you see them as a client, you're not the target of their abuse or their manipulation. Or if, if you are, it's not going to be that overt. Like they might be trying to charm you or schmooze you. They're not trying to destroy you. So it's not me being drama or me like misreading the situation. It's just, you haven't experienced what we've experienced. And trust me, this kind of evil stuff, it exists and it's out there. So that kind of stuff makes me just see red. It's so invalidating. And I, but at the same time, it's like, I get it. I would have had a hard time understanding that this stuff was going on too, had I not been on the receiving end of it. but it's frustrating. Here's the thing too, I'll touch on this real quick and then we'll start doing our guided meditation. So, you know, people, and this is another thing I hear from a lot of people, they'll say, oh, but you know, only about 4% of the population would be considered antisocial personality disorder. That may be true. I think that number's low, but let's just say that number is accurate, okay? Um, it depends on like the situation and it depends on where you're at. So like, it's not just a 4% across the board. So here, like, here's an example. So I just put something up to sell when I was in Colorado visiting my mom, I put up this old piece of furniture that's in her garage up for sale on Craigslist. And they have very clearly on Craigslist, you know, do not accept personal checks from people. It is a scam. Like, this is what they do. Don't do it. And so sure enough, I get my first text message from a person, they want to send a check, right? It's pretty obvious. It's a scam. English isn't that good. The whole thing was squirrely and it ends with them wanting to send the check. If I had gone into that mindset that a lot of people have, which is like, oh, but only 4% of people out there are really going to be scammers, you know, then I would have not seen the other like five scammers that followed for what they were, I would have thought, well, I met the quota, right? Like I came across one scammer, the other 96% of the people out there are going to be sincere, normal, decent people. Like that's kind of faulty thinking too. So just because there's a, you know, 4% or even 10% of population that would be considered narcissists or sociopaths, it depends. Like if you're hanging out you know, with a bunch of people that don't have morals, like it could be a hundred percent of that, those people in that group that are that way. I think online dating, the percentage there is a lot higher. 
there's a lot of very disingenuous people out there. They're married, they're in a relationship, they're just looking to have sex, they're looking to scam somebody out of money. It's a lot higher than 4%. So, um, you know, it's just, there is no shortcut to, to being kind of situationally aware and aware of yourself and how problematic situations register with you. Yeah, Carol says, yeah, they can fool people. There are people in mental health who are very messed up themselves and that's scary to think of. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, just because a person is a mental health professional does not mean that they are like, that they've got everything all figured out. <laughs> like, it means they have a degree in some field pertaining to mental health. That's all that means. So that's, a, that's what's so difficult is that it's really hard to kind of tell what, who is this person that you're getting advice from, especially, especially in mental health where we're, people are so quick and I'm guilty of it too, where people can be so quick to think like, well, but this person's a therapist, they must know best, or they're a psychiatrist, they must know best. So even though my internal alarms are screaming at me, if they're telling me that this is due to my PTSD or that, you know, they're minimizing stuff or whatever, it can be really easy for a person to be like, they must know what they're talking about. They're the professional. Who am I to question them? And it's really important that you realize as far as, especially as professions and stuff go, it's a data point. It's, it's not the end all be all. It's just the data point. It depends. There's so many other data points to consider, like their own boundaries and standards and understandings and deal breakers. And, you know, I mean, and of course we don't have access to any of that. So all you can do is kind of tell, like, how do I feel? Am I getting the results that I'm trying to get? with this person, you know, do they seem to understand? Do we have that rapport or are they invalidating me and minimizing me and making it trying to seem like it's a relationship issue and like, it's not, I'm this is an abusive relationship is the issue. So I'm a big fan. If, uh, of support groups. I think, um, I think in general, it's a great way here. Here's how I like to utilize support groups. And I think I would encourage other people to utilize support groups in a similar way is it can be great to, to get the feedback from a, um, a lot of people that have been there, done that keeping in mind, it's the general public, right? Like, again, some people you're going to really jive with and click with, and some, some people like not at all. Uh, so, but it's a good way to get a wide variety of feedback. And it's a good way to hear, to learn about different resources and all different kinds of things that are out there from people that have lived it, they've been through this. So that can be very helpful. Uh, and also if you're, if you're finding yourself questioning things you can go in there and be like, Hey, I was, this is what's going on. And this is what I'm feeling a little bit concerned about. It can be kind of good training wheels almost to just get that validation of, is this a problem? Is this not a problem? And people will tell you like, Oh, a girl, like that's a problem guy. That's a problem. And here's why that it's kind of a stage and understanding. I really, I really think. And then hopefully down the road, there comes a time where you're able to tell for yourself if something's a problem enough to where you're not needing that validation from others, you know, but at first when a person's doubting their perceptions, they're doubting their feelings, they're doubting the people, everything, they can be so lost that sometimes they really, it really can be helpful to just talk to other people that have been there, done that. So I hope that helps. Yeah. And Kevin is mentioning my form. I have two. So I have a website group, which is, you can read more about it and stuff on my website, thriveafterabuse.com. You can find the support group there. And then I also have a Facebook group, but obviously realize that the Facebook group, it's going to be attached to your Facebook profile, which may 
may or may not be something that you're okay with. If you're, if you're want, and there's a lot of other groups as well on Facebook. I'm a big fan of people joining a handful of them and seeing kind of which ones resonate best with you. But uh, you may want to create a fake profile to join Facebook groups so you can keep that anonymity. So, okay, so with that said, let's get comfortable and just kind of take some time and practice getting grounded within ourselves. So if you are in a chair or lying down, just take a moment to just get comfortable and feel, just kind of feel yourself in your body. Turn your attention inward. Let's take seven deep breaths in through your nose and then out through your mouth. With each breath, allowing that breath to go deeper and deeper. down into the bases of your lungs, down into your diaphragm and your stomach, further and further down. Down into your hips and your thighs in your calves. Feeling each restorative healing breath as it brings that oxygen into your system. Just noticing what it feels like to be in your body, to be fully present in this moment in your body. Turning your attention inward, listening to your heartbeat. Feeling your heartbeat in your chest. Just being fully present in the moment. Now bringing your attention up to the top of your head. Relaxing. Relaxing your head, your forehead, your eyes. releasing any tension that you might be storing in your cheeks or in your jaw. 
Allowing your tongue to fall from the roof of your mouth and let your jaw hang open. Feeling the heaviness of your face as it's fully relaxed. Relaxing your neck and your shoulders, allowing your shoulders to just drop down and fall back, allowing your chest to open. Relaxing your arms, your stomach, your hands, your hips, allowing your legs to fall into whatever position is the most comfortable for you. Relaxing your calves and your feet. Now let's take seven more deep breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth. And this time, let's visualize a restorative healing light. Maybe that light is white or maybe it's like a silver. As you breathe that in, allowing that just wonderful restorative energy just to swirl and flow through your body, repairing every single cell that it's touching allowing you to be fully grounded in the moment, just cleansing all of the negativity and the toxicity and the pain that you've experienced. And as you exhale, blowing out, releasing all of that negativity, toxicity, or pain. And you might want to visualize this as some sort of gray color, like exhaust from a car. And with each cycle of each breath in, each breath out, try to push out more and more of that junk that's in your system and replacing it with, heal, with healing. And so as you're doing that, noticing that each exhale is getting, becoming lighter in color, it's becoming cleaner. And the goal is for each inhale to be a light white silver color. And for each exhale, at the very end of the seven breaths that we'll do here in a second, to also be as clean as you can get it, ideally like a white or a completely clear color. Okay, so let's do that for seven breaths. Releasing any anxiety, pain, fear, toxicity. Realizing that in this moment that you are safe, you are fully present in your body and that it's okay to go ahead and release as much of that stuff as you're ready to release. Now noticing how much more of your body feels deeply connected into all that is good and right. 
Just feeling that connection, knowing that there is so much that is good and right about you, that you're doing so many things right and that you have come so incredibly far. And just acknowledging how far you've really come and how much more you're grounded in yourself and that you're getting every single day, you are getting so much more figured out. Even if you're not consciously aware that that's happening, it really is. You are growing every single day. You're becoming more and more deeply rooted in who you are. You're becoming more empowered. You're becoming more in tune with yourself. It's just such an exciting time. You're just starting such an amazing chapter in your life. So let's take a few moments and just send some of that light and love out to supportive people out there, to possibly other people in the chat, or other people in your life, just connecting you to everything good and right giving people, sending out just like an energetic hug, letting them know that you're thankful, that you're just thankful. when you're ready, come on back. Make sure to give yourself a really big energetic hug. Just acknowledging that you are just, there's so much right about you. There really is. And that you're going to get through this and that you're going to grow through this. And you're going to squeeze out as much as you possibly can. And you're going to use this for your highest and greatest good. And when you're ready, go ahead and open your eyes. So thank you guys so much for joining me tonight. And I hope to see you guys next week. Uh, we're, don't forget, we're going to have book club next week. So if you have any questions, we're going to be discussing my book, Out of the Fog. So uh, if you have any questions about it, please feel free to ask. And I will see you next Wednesday, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, and then book club will be 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Thursday. So I'll see you then. Have a fantastic rest of your week. So lots of love to you guys. You are not alone. You are not crazy. And you really can move forward and heal from this. So take care and have a fantastic rest of your week. Okay, good night.